morning and welcome to the fourth meeting in 2015 of the Finance Committee of the Scottish Parliament. Could I please remind everyone present to please turn off all mobile phones, electronic devices, etc. Our first item of business today is to take evidence as part of our inquiry into proposals for further fiscal devolution. Uh, this will consist of two separate evidence sessions. In our first evidence session, we will hear from the Right Honourable Danny Alexander, Chief Secretary to the Treasury, and Lindsay Fussell, who is Director of Public Services at HM Treasury. I would like to welcome you both warmly uh, to uh, the meeting. We might have to communicate by semaphore, though it seems like you seem to be quite far away. You know, <laughs> don't remember you being so far. Only physically, not in uh, um, any other way. So you know the drill. Basically, what will happen is that uh, you know I'll ask you some initial questions, and uh, the, the committee will uh, will then be opened up uh, to the rest of the committee. But first, uh, um, I understand you have a brief statement um, for the committee. Um, yeah, I mean, firstly, thank you for having me. I think I was the first Treasury Minister ever to be appear before this committee and have made uh, regular appearances uh, since uh, 2010. And I hope that establishes a precedent that no matter who's in government next time around, that you'll continue to have uh, access to Treasury Ministers, because I think it's an important part of the uh, dialogue between uh, the, the Scottish Parliament and the, and the UK Parliament and, and UK government. Um, obviously, uh, I'm here to, to talk about the fiscal devolution in the Smith Commission, but obviously happy to answer questions on, on I know there are some other subjects you've been looking at lately, so you may want to, 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 to raise some of those things too. Um, I think that the settlement that is set out in the command paper, which follows on from the uh, Smith Commission, is one which offers huge opportunities for us uh, here in Scotland. I think it's a settlement that is uh, built to last because it makes the Scottish Parliament, when this is all implemented, uh, one of the most uh, financially powerful devolved institutions uh, anywhere uh, in, the, in the developed world. Um, and in particular, uh, the, for the first time, the majority of the Scottish Government's budget will be funded by taxation uh, that's raised uh, in Scotland rather than through uh, a block grant um, and includes also significant um, uh, welfare devolution. I hope, it's, I hope actually it's something we can all agree on, that, that this is a very, very significant uh, progress for Scotland within the United Kingdom, that this uh, command paper absolutely delivers both on what, what the Smith Commission recommended, and that was agreed by all five parties around the table, uh, but also um, uh, delivers on the promises that were made uh, during the course of the, uh, of the, of, of the referendum campaign. Um, I think it's very important that we have within here, without, without having worked through all the details yet between John Swinney and myself and between the Scottish Government and the UK Government, some very, very clear principles about how the fiscal framework um, within which the new system will operate, how, the principles by which that is governed, and particularly this, this, this no detriment principle, which in a sense ensures that uh, there's no uh, gain or loss as a consequence of the fact of devolution to either Scotland or the rest of the UK, but which does confer uh, a proper responsibility to bear the consequences of actions determined here and actions determined uh, in, uh, in the UK Parliament. Obviously, there's some significant further work that needs to be done on the details of that fiscal framework, but I think that uh, the, the principle set out here and the fact that, for example, we have been able to agree a good fiscal framework already under the 2012 Act for the Scottish rate, rate of Income Tax shows that whilst there's work to be done there, it, it, is, it is perfectly possible to come up with a fiscal framework that delivers uh, uh, on these uh, principles. And in a sense, I hope the debate, you obviously have a particular role in scrutinising the, the detail of this, but I hope that the debate in Scotland will move on to how these powers can be used, because they do offer a significant suite of powers and responsibilities that can be used for the good of people here in Scotland. OK, well, thank you uh, very much for that opening statement. And I will start by asking about the, the, the fiscal uh, framework. Um, I mean, paragraph 2.2.7 uh, of the command paper states, and I quote, that the fiscal framework must require Scotland to contribute proportionately to fiscal consolidation at the pace set out by the UK government across devolved and reserved areas. Uh, in, in your view, how does this impact on the flexibility available to the Scottish Government uh, to use its own economic levers, um, and would it not cause some constraint on those uh, levers? I don't think it offers any constraint, actually, on the, on the financial levers that are contained here. So uh, if the Scottish Government uh, wished, for example, to increase taxes in order to pay for extra investment in a particular area, that has no effect on the overall fiscal balance 
um, across the UK because extra spending has been matched, has been paid for by tax revenues. Likewise, if the, uh, if the um, Scottish Parliament decided that it wished to, for example, reduce air passenger duty, um, uh, which has I know been canvassed by some, um, then uh, that would be matched by uh, 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 a, a reduction in the, the money that was available for the Scottish Government to spend. So again, that's fiscally neutral. I think that the point that's being made um, which is spelled out further in the, in, the, in the subsequent paragraph to the one that you quoted, um, is uh, that in all um, uh, uh, devolved settings around the world, you have fiscal rules to stop, for example, a devolved institution running up massive extra borrowing where the, uh, in an unconstrained way um, that then exposes the remainder of the country to having to take decisions to deal with those problems. In terms of the flexibilities, it has no impact on those whatsoever. Right. So, for example, um, if the UK government of whatever colour decided to make significant cuts in public spending, there would clearly be impact on the on the, the the block grant because the block grant is still going to remain. So, surely that would indeed have some impact on the ability of the devolved administration to operate as indeed it has done in recent years. Well, in a sense, that wouldn't change from the from the from the current uh, mm -hmm. situation, except to the extent that the the block grant becomes uh, less important as 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 as, uh, as a as a proportion of the totality of the expenditure. So, the moment you have a situation where the block grant, I think, accounts for about 90% of the expenditure, um, the remainder comes from business rates. Um, under the 2012 Act, that would reduce to some extent. But under w w once this is implemented in the early part of the of the next Parliament, um, the the block grant determined by the Barnett formula would be responsible for. Uh, I mean, the, the, the numbers vary, but uh, but around a third, 35% or so, of the expenditure uh, undertaken by the uh, by the Scottish Government. So, of course, you're right to say that uh, that continues to be determined by the Barnett formula. That's been agreed by everybody. And the Barnett formula operates um, by allocating to Scotland, Wales and Northern Ireland uh, a block grant uh, in proportion to the overall expenditure that's determined in, in departments for England by the UK government. That bit would continue. Actually, with the much more substantial tax powers, uh, Scotland has much more, the Scottish Parliament has much more choice about does it want to maintain expenditure by asking people to contribute more? Does it want to? Uh, would, it, would it wish to stimulate the economy by cutting taxes and bearing the cost? Um, so you, you're right, but it's less. It's less. It will become a less significant factor in the overall determination of the resources spent by the Scottish government than, than, than it is now. Okay, uh, we've got a lot of areas to cover, and I want to ensure that members of the committee get an opportunity to question. So I'm going to try and move on um, and talk about the, the block grant and, and the Barnet formula, which you've already uh, touched on, of course. Uh, we took evidence, as you probably know, from a huge uh, range of uh, academics uh, with a, a, a variety of views on this entire process. Yeah. And uh, one of them uh, was uh, Professor uh, Trench, who you will be uh, familiar with. Um, and he talked about, in terms of the, the, the kind of uh, the, the, the block grant and uh, formula system and the Barnett formula. He said that, uh, and I quote, all key decisions regarding the working of the formula and the block grant and formula system are taken by HM Treasury. Um, and uh, there's real issues in terms of transparency on that. Professor Heald suggested to the committee that there's a transparency deficit that is undesirable now and unless removed would make major devolved taxes unworkable. Um, uh, Professor Trench said there are very strong reasons to change the way the grant is administered <coughs> and organised, so fewer decisions are taken unilaterally by HM Treasury uh, about the working of, of the formula and the funds allocated to it and greater scope for impartial intervention. And this theme was continued by Professor McLean, who said how the Barnett formula works is entirely in the hands of HM Treasury. It's not a statutory matter for the Scottish Parliament or the Scottish Government. And, and, you know, I could go on and on and on, I mean, uh, with this kind of, uh, this kind of comment. Uh, I'll just finish on one before uh, I'll allow you to answer. Professor Trench said, uh, 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 questions why, and I quote, our financing system essentially depends on an informal Treasury document that the Treasury drafts on its own. Uh, the Treasury was not merely judging its own case with a jury from its side of the fence, but it wrote the rules as well. And he suggests that at the very least there needs to be an impartial mediator. 
uh, and, that the role, and that the devolved administration should have a role in drafting and agreeing a revised statement. So in terms of Barnet and in terms of this mm. whole area, there seems to be from, uh, from a, a whole variety of economists of different political uh, uh, persuasions um, um, uh, a real concern about transparency in terms of how this is actually going to work, how the Treasury actually operates, and the kind of murky Byzantine process that is the, is the, the, the Barnett formula. So I just wonder if you can enlighten us a, a wee bit on, um, I'm sorry to be, too, to be too verbo very verbose in this, but I think it's a key aspect of no, this. No, I understand the question, um, and um, I haven't had a chance to study all the evidence sure. that you've described, I'm yes. sorry, but from the... Uh, from the quotes you've given, I'd say that I disagree with it. I, having been Chief Secretary for nearly five years now, I think I'm the longest serving Chief Secretary not to have a formula named after them. So maybe we can, uh, we can change that in the last few months of this government. Um, uh, uh, but I've been responsible for, for, for this. And I can honestly say that I can't recall a single occasion, except once when there was a mathematical error made on a spreadsheet, uh, where there has been a, uh, a disagreement about the way the formula has been uh, uh, operated. Um, by any of the devolved um, uh, uh, governments. There are, of course, uh, political arguments about um, the policy decisions that are being made about public expenditure. You, you hinted at that in your, earlier, uh, in your earlier question. But in terms of how the Barnett formula operates, um, it's all set out in a document called the Statement of Funding Policy, which I'm sure you've, you're familiar with. Um, and the Statement of Funding Policy sets out a whole range of ways in which, in which this works. Um, including the comparability factors for different areas of policy um, and how they apply to, 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 to when you make a spending adjustment, let's say, in the budget of the Department for Communities and Local Government in England, how does that then get reflected in the, in the overall allocations? Um, now, that is complicated because there are lots and lots of funding streams. In many cases, they have slightly different comparability factors and so on. The population figures that get put in are a matter of, um, of, of public record put together by the Independent Statistics Authority. Um, all of the details of Barnet consequentials for any budget or spending review are, uh, as a matter of course, um, shared between the UK government and the, and the Scottish government. And um, if there's ever any wish to update the statement of funding policy, as we did, I think, in the <coughs> 2010 um, spending round, um, and as has happened occasionally when, for example, it, when a new area of responsibility is devolved, clearly you have to establish what are the, the Barnett comparability factors for that area and add that to the statement of funding policy. That has to be done um, in, uh, in consultation with uh, uh, all of the devolved administrations in Scotland, Wales and Northern Ireland. Um, so uh, whilst the, the way it operates is not simple, it's, it, because there are so many different elements, it's, it's complicated. Actually, I don't think there's any lack of transparency um, in terms of uh, the, the, the way the formula works. And I think that the fact that there is a widespread political consensus, I think amongst all parties in this parliament, um, and I think amongst all parties in the Westminster parliament, with the exception of the UK Independence Party, um, uh, about the Barnett formula and wanting to continue with the Barnett formula, that suggests that actually um, that there, is, there, is, there is widespread support for continuing uh, to operate it long into the future. That certainly be, be, would certainly be my view. Okay, but um, Professor uh, uh, McLean of Oxford says that um, if the Scottish Parliament or the Scottish Government does not like what HM Treasury is doing, there are no mechanisms <coughs> to pursue that except perhaps a joint ministerial committee. And he suggests that the block grant should be determined by a public body under joint control of uh, devolved and UK parliaments, which is, uh, for example, what happens in Australia. Um, that there is a real issue about the fact that there doesn't seem to be any democratic accountability in terms of this. That's certainly what our academic colleagues are saying. And the issue of transparency seems to be a kind of as I said, regardless of the, polit the, the political views of, of our witnesses, uh, th there seems to be real concerns about it. I mean, Professor Hill, for example, talks about treasury gaming and uh, etc. So what, how, how do you deal with that kind of, that, that kind of issue? I'm not sure I have much, that much to add to what I said before. I just, I just, for the reasons I've set out, I, I don't agree with the, with the points that are, uh, that are being made. I'd say that there are, are actually a number of... Um, institutional structures that enable this sort of thing to be discussed and raised. So we, in addition to the Joint Ministerial Committee that you referred to, uh, under the 2012 Act, we also established the Joint Exchequer Committee, mm. which I know you've, 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 you're familiar with, um, which looks at a range of issues there and provides a forum. In addition, we have uh, regular uh, so-called Finance Minister's Quadrilaterals, which are a meeting with myself uh, and the Finance Ministers of the 
whoever's, whoever holds the office of Chief Secretary and the, the Finance Ministers uh, of the three devolved administrations. That, that meets um, a couple of times a year um, and uh, you know, w has made decisions uh, uh, on some aspects, for example, about how budget exchange works in respect of uh, devolved administrations, um, which isn't part of the Barnett formula, but is part of the, uh, the financial framework. So I think there are... I think there are plenty of mechanisms uh, for these things to be dealt with. Of course, I'm accountable to the, to, to the House of Commons, which is one of Scotland's parliaments. John Swinney is accountable to this parliament. Uh, so there is democratic scrutiny through both those uh, um, uh, channels. And um, we both have the opportunity, should we ever wish to, to raise complaints or issues about how the thing is operated. Uh, the, I'd say that um, the operation of the Barnett formula is a... Is a, is a technocratic operation where the, um, the, the, the sort of outcome of the mathematical calculations can, and is, can be and is scrutinised by officials in the Scottish Government, the Welsh Government and the Northern Irish, Northern Irish Assembly Government. Um, and uh, as I say, I can only recall, though, um, uh, I, can, I can recall one occasion when a, a mistake was made in a spreadsheet and that was picked up very quickly and, and corrected. So, um, but apart from that, I can't recall any... Um, occasions when uh, the operation of the Barnett formula as against a political argument about the policy decisions that provided the inputs um, had, 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 been, had been an issue that was brought to my attention. There seems to be um, a lot of, um, I don't know, cobwebs wrapped around some of these committees. I mean, the Joint Exchequer Committee hasn't met since February 2013. I mean, that's two years ago. And the quadrilateral since November 2013. So I'm not really sure how they can provide really any effective scrutiny, um, you know, as you've suggested <coughs> uh, in terms of this. But, uh, I think the quadrilateral's met more recently than that, but I, I, I will check my diary and by all means come sure. back to you. But, the, but in, in terms of the Barnett formula, it's also a question of what the Barnett formula I mean, means. I mean, for example, it's going to be retained. Is it going to be retained um, as a population-based adjustment uh, mechanism uh, in combination with needs assessment? Or, and, and, and will Scotland's um, relative per capita public expenditure share be maintained? Because it's one thing, you know, it's a, the Barnett formula is a name, but it's what it actually means on the ground, I think, is what people are really wanting to, to, to know. So I would not propose, and there's no, there are no proposals within from the UK government, or, and I'm not aware of any from any political party, um, to change... Uh, anything at all about how the Barnett formula operates. What changes under the, the proposals of the Smith Commission as set out in the command paper is that the block grant itself becomes relatively less important in the totality of Scottish Government funding. Because effectively what you would then have is um, uh, the, the amount of money available for the Scottish Government to spend being the, um, the, uh, the sum of um, the block grant... Uh, that comes out of the Barnett formula, um, less adjustments for tax taxation, so block grant deductions that, 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 that would be agreed, as we have, for example, on stamp duty and on income tax under the 2012 Act, um, plus uh, allocations in respect of the, of the welfare provisions here under the new uh, fiscal framework. And that's what would, um, that's what add up, would add up to um, the total amount of funding available. And so... The way in which the, um, the, the, the block grant part of that equation is calculated, um, there are no proposals to make any changes to, um, uh, it, it, but because of the much greater degree of financial responsibility of devolution of tax powers and indeed welfare powers that's proposed here um, uh, and that will happen in the next parliament, uh, you will see the block grant moving from current situation where it's about 90%, responsible for about 90% of the money that is spent in Scotland to a situation where it's more like 35% or so uh, of the total amount of money spent in Scotland and the rest of it comes from taxes that are raised directly and so on. Okay. Let's uh, m move on to the issue of borrowing. I've quoted a host of professors to already. So you have. A couple more, I'm afraid. Uh, Professor uh, MacDonald um, argues that in terms of borrowing, the Scottish, if the Scottish Government has been asked to take on more fiscal risk, it really needs more borrowing powers. Uh, his view is that borrowing should be done in the open market, as this is the only clean and effective way to bring market discipline. And Professor Muscatelli suggests borrowing powers should be extended to allow each devolved part of the UK to smooth out asymmetric macroeconomic shocks, which 
temporarily affect uh, tax revenues. And indeed, the Smith Commission recommended uh, the Scottish Government should, and I quote, have sufficient additional borrowing powers to ensure budgetary stability and provide safeguards to smooth Scotland pu Scottish public spending in the event of economic shocks consistent with a sustainable overall UK fiscal framework. What's your view on the, on, on, on the, issue, the issue of borrowing? I mean, you touched on it early in your yeah. statement, but is this something which uh, you believe uh, and are keen to see uh, implemented, or, you, or would you like to see the existing kind of um, framework uh, retained? Um, I, think that it, I think it would be right that, um, as part of the discussions that we have about the fiscal framework, that it, precisely as Smith recommended, that, that borrowing should be part of that um, uh, should be part of that discussion, and that where uh, the Scottish Parliament is taking on greater responsibility for tax raising, that precisely as I'm not sure which one of it was, but one of the professors you quoted talked about the need to use borrowing as a way of smoothing out fluctuations in tax receipts, um, that that's an area where when you have more tax receipts, you potentially need more borrowing for smoothing purposes. So I can see that that is absolutely something which would be very much part of the, the fiscal framework that we would put in place. As you know at the moment, um, under the 2012 Act, uh, there's a borrowing framework which includes both borrowing for that smoothing purpose um, and then borrowing for, for, for capital expenditure, um, both within, uh, within limits. Um, and I can certainly see uh, that... Um, that, that with greater tax powers, you would want to see greater borrowing powers to help with that smoothing. Um, as to whether that borrowing takes place from the markets or from, uh, uh, from within the UK, from the Public Work Loan Board or, or the, the National Loans Fund or whatever, um, as you know, we, we've, we've already um, taken steps to devolve the power to issue bonds to the Scottish Government. So that then becomes a, a value for money judgment um, for the Scottish Government to make. Where does it want to borrow funds from? What are the issues around that? Um, provided that borrowing takes place within the overall framework, which, which, which uh, governs uh, the way that borrowing takes place, then I, I, can, I, I can very much see Professor MacDonald's argument that a bit of market discipline uh, is, is helpful. Equally, if that ends up being more expensive than, for example, UK guilt rates, then I think you might have questions to ask as to why um, the Scottish Government was choosing to pay higher interest rates. Uh, and, and, you know, so that's the judgment that would have to be made. But in, in, I've, got no, um, I've got no wish to influence that choice. I, that choice is, is, is already available um, under the current framework. OK, uh, thank you. I'm just going to ask one uh, question in one more area, um, which is a block grant adjustment before opening out to colleagues uh, around the table. And one of the issues in terms of the block grant adjustment has been uh, transparency, and I'm sure others will explore that in depth. But the one I was wanting to ask you about was the constraining factor. The Cabinet Secretary uh, for Finance, uh, Constitution and Economy said the Treasury had sought to include a constraining factor within block grant adjustment, uh, which means that attempting to calculate up to 2029 or 230, what the devolved taxes would generate and adjust the block grant on this basis so that neither the UK nor Scotland would be worse off. And the committee um, uh, agreed that with the Cabinet Secretary that this defeats the point of devolving the taxes. Um, and obviously we're, we're raising this with you. I mean, what, uh, sure what's the point about, 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 about having these powers is that, you know, we stand or fall by the decisions we make as a parliament right. within our... Within, within the framework and powers, that are, whatever those powers are that we are allocated, and there is a real concern that, you know, if there is, you know, say for example, the Scottish economy does better than the UK yeah. average, then obviously the block grants clawed back, uh, and if we do worse, well, that's that's our fault. So the UK shouldn't really have to subsidise that. So it's just that to, I wonder if you can clarify the position on that because that is a real concern that. We, could have, we can enact whatever policies, but at the end of the day, it's not going to make a blind bit of difference if this constraining factor is implemented. So I agree with, what you, with you on that. Right. Um, uh, and the whole framework here is designed precisely to ensure that, um, uh, that, that, that exactly as you say, that if, the, that if the Scottish Parliament makes decisions that are beneficial and lead to higher tax revenues over time, that that is something which should benefit the resources available to the Scottish Government. And likewise, if mistakes are made which lead to the economy growing less well or, you know, whatever, then uh, the, 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 those consequences should be borne. That's the whole point of devolution. It's, a, it's about devolving those responsibilities. And, um, you know, that's why I think what we need to do and what Smith recommended was put in place a fiscal framework which ensures no detriment uh, at the starting point, 
which is indexed in a way that is appropriate, so that, so that the fact of devolution itself, I think you wouldn't argue, I, I would hope, that, that the simple fact of devolution should lead to a financial gain or loss. What you're arguing for is that the, the, the effect of policy should be something that, that, is, um, that is felt by the, either by the, by the Scottish Government in respect of its policies or by the UK Government in respect of its policies, but there's a degree of sort of insulation between the two. Um, I also think, though, in that context, it's actually quite important to have a, an adjustment mechanism that is transparent and which is um, able to operate as automatically as possible. I mean, it's one of the, it's one of the, uh, one of the strengths of the Barnett formula, in a sense, is that it, it does operate on a kind of automatic basis. You feed the numbers in, you get the outcome. It's not a matter for kind of negotiation or haggling. Um, likewise, uh, when we ag agreed the, and John Sweeney and I agreed it between us, um, the, the financial framework for the devolution of the Scottish rate of income tax under the 2012 Act, we agreed a system of indexation there um, uh, in respect of that, which we both agreed was, was uh, an appropriate mechanism that would, um, uh, which, which would ensure no detriment, but also enable benefits or losses from policy choices to be, to be, to be felt here. Um, and that's what we need to do uh, with this wider fiscal framework. Um, and in a sense, with a, with a bigger amount of taxation involved, a bigger basket of taxes, if you like, um, getting that right is, of course, important. But actually, because th th there's a bigger basket of taxes, I think in some ways it makes it more straightforward. OK, uh, thank you <coughs> for that. Um, first uh, colleague to ask questions will be Mark, to be followed by Malcolm. Uh, thank you very much, and good morning. Um, just to follow on in terms of um, transparency and block grant adjustment, um, obviously we've just gone through the process in regard to the land and buildings transaction tax. The Scottish Government had to set, it, set out its, its rates in October um, and there was a consultation period that took place in relation to that. But the final impact on the block grant was not known at the time and indeed was not a conclusion on that was not reached until quite close to the actual budget stage one uh, process. Do you think that is acceptable and do you think it's something that needs to be addressed particularly in relation to future devolution of taxation? Um, I think that it was, it was uh, necessary in this case and in fact when you're dealing, I mean stamp duty is a particular example because you're dealing with a tax that is quite volatile and where um, a lot of work had to be done both here and by the OBR to look at the forecasting of revenues and, and, and so on. And also in the context where um, uh, we knew, but because of budget secrecy couldn't reveal, that we were planning also to make a reform of, of stamp duty, something that I personally argued for for very, very many years. Um, and so it, w it made more sense um, to, for John and I to agree the, the adjustment um, uh, in that context. And also, of course, with this happening um, uh, uh, in the context of the kind of wider fiscal discussion off the back of Smith and the command paper and so on, um, uh, we felt it was sensible to agree a de the deduction, which we agreed very amicably, by the way, in the numbers um, for 2015-16. Um, and then that allows us a little bit more time to look at the evidence to uh, see how we can incorporate that in a, in a, in a wider fiscal framework for the future. Um, and I, I think that it was handled, I think it was handled uh, appropriately. And of course, if I can make one other point, Chair, on this, in case it doesn't come up, I mean, there are, we've obviously agreed the, 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 the headline deduction, the 494 in 2015-16, um, but I've also agreed that there's, there's some forestalling going on because um, uh, John had to announce his rates well before they were implemented, which has, an, has caused some behavioural consequences. Um, w a sort of early application of the no detriment principle will mean that um, to the extent that there is forestalling, in other words, people bringing forward transactions, selling houses before the deadline, um, which wouldn't otherwise have happened, that causes extra stamp duty revenue to flow to the exchequer, it wouldn't be appropriate for the exchequer to be the beneficiary of forestalling against a policy made here. And so, uh, and we don't know the amounts yet, um, but uh, given that um, that forestalling has taken place as a consequence of decisions made here, uh, that money should in due course be paid back. So, that, so in addition to the 494, there'll be some 
um, money coming back on the forestalling, and then I think quite reasonably, um, uh, with this being a new power and there potentially being small time lags between uh, the power being implemented and, and money coming in, um, uh, we'll look at whether there's any cash support that's needed through the year, just to, move, uh, to you know, in the first year to smooth those um, fluctuations. In fact, I know that uh, John Swinney's written to me this morning saying that, um, uh, and I think he's sent this to you as well, Chair, um, to say that um, the Scottish Government is now con con content that it's ready to switch on this power in the on, uh, at the beginning of April. Um, and there's a formal process that we have to, uh, to go through. I can confirm to you that um, HMRC is also ready, and so that will all happen. I, mean, he's, it, I, I don't have a view on whether the Scottish Government's ready. That's for John to, that's for John to decide. Uh, HMRC is also ready, so we'll have that exchange of letters very soon, and um, uh, uh, the, the, the sort of formal switching on of the powers, which enables that, that devolution to, to, to happen precisely as planned. Okay. just want to come back. You used the, the, the term budget secrecy, which I think is quite important in the context of what we're discussing, because obviously um, in relation to um, land buildings transaction tax, there was a requirement on the Scottish Government to consult on its rates uh, ahead of implementation. The, the same is true in the sense that under, I think under SRIT, there will be a requirement to notify Treasury in, I think it's November, uh, of, the, of the plans in relation to those rates. Now, Professor Heald, in his evidence, has suggested that these are areas which could leave the Scottish Government vulnerable to what he terms gaming, and um, you know th this, this would apply irrespective of who was occupying the, the keys to the Treasury at the time. Um, and I think the, the view, he says, the, the UK budgetary timetable must be pulled forward. There has to be less opportunity for political theatre on the part of UK chancellors of the Exchequer, which I think refers to, you know, uh, announcements in the budget which have not been given any sort of uh, warning of in advance, particularly when they relate to taxation that uh, is, is also being dealt with at a devolved level. Do, do you see the need for there to be some changes to the internal fiscal rules? I mean, for example, the Law Society of Scotland have spoken to this committee about the need for there to be some form of fair play clause or, or fin agreement around financial fair play in relation to how Treasury rules operate uh, in relation to taxes which are devolved? Um, so there's quite a lot of different things in there. Firstly, um, uh, I, I, don't think there's any, I don't think there's any need to change the way in which budget decisions um, are made um, UK-wide. Uh, how those decisions are made in Scotland is a matter for the Scottish Government. How, and, you know, uh, naturally enough, um, John Swinney did not consult me on which, what rates he was going to set for land and buildings trans transaction tax or how he was going to announce them or whatever. That's his business. He, he came out and announced it. That was devised by the Scottish Government, his officials, um, uh, uh, and, and him and his ministerial colleagues, and that's entirely appropriate. Uh, likewise, um, we spent time considering how we wanted to reform stamp duty at a UK level. We made those decisions and we announced them in the normal way. Um, uh, uh, we took the view, which the Scottish Government may wish to take in future, but obviously uh, in this first instance wasn't able to for the reasons that you say, um, we took the view that changes to the rates should apply immediately, precisely to avoid the sort of forestalling that you might otherwise see. Um, and, uh, it, but I think in terms of um, uh, sort of fair play here, Actually, that's one of the reasons why the fiscal framework and the no detriment clause is so important. Um, because uh, clearly, if, um, for example, uh, the UK government decides to cut taxes uh, in areas that are uh, devolved, then that needs to needs to that would naturally result in a reduction in expenditure on. Uh, 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 devolved services in other parts of the UK. But but the framework needs to ensure that that doesn't result in a reduction in expenditure. Uh, here in Scotland. So that's one of the things that we set out in the command paper that needs to be uh, looked at. In respect of income tax, um, uh, uh, where we're using um, the same mechanisms, um, uh, there are time lags that administratively take place in order to make sure that, um, that, that, that the collection can take place. So for example, um, uh, we have made something that I've pushed as, a, as, a, as a, the, the Liberal Democrat Minister in the Treasury. We've made significant increases to the income tax parcel allowance over the course of this Parliament. Um, those have all been announced either in the, in, the, in the budget a year before the decision 
or on some occasions in the autumn statement four months before, four or five months before implementation, and not at the budget implemented in, in 10, days, 10 days later, precisely because the, the, the practical mechanisms just don't allow some of those decisions to be implemented that quickly. So um, uh, HMRC needs that time to put its systems in place to have, for example, a higher personal allowance. It's not something you can do overnight. There are some other things you can do overnight, like on the, 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 the stamp duty reform, or where we decided it was necessary to do it overnight for, for wider economic reasons. Sure, but the, the, the point I think that was being made um, by, by Professor Heald in his evidence to the committee was that if the Scottish Government were to uh, has to advise Treasury of its intentions in November and the UK budget is not set until April, that is quite a significant period of time between um, the Scottish Government having to, to set its position out and the Treasury announcing its position. And he's highlighted in a number of instances, uh, I won't go into detail on them, but, but you, I, I would commend you to, to have a look at the evidence he's provided to the committee, where there could be um, what he, he refers to as retaliatory instruments or, or, or um, gaming by, by the Treasury uh, in response to decisions that are taken by the, the Scottish Government. So really it's just wh whether you would agree with his analysis that there needs to be an examination of the, the framework that is being operated in terms of the fiscal rules. I don't want to say the same thing that I said before. I, I, don't, I think that the, 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 uh, the, the suggestion uh, um, about sort of gaming is, is, um, uh, is, is, not, is not right. Um, I don't agree with that. I don't think there's any evidence to support it. Um, but but I, what I would say is the, the, the whole purpose of the fiscal framework and the no detriment clause is to enable both the UK Parliament and the Scottish Parliament to take decisions in their own ways and with their own processes and to their own timescales, and for, exactly as the uh, convener was saying earlier, for um, each uh, 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 Parliament to bear the responsibility for its own decisions. And so that fiscal framework needs to be adaptable so that if um, uh, there are uh, changes in tax rates at different places that, that, you, that you don't have uh, that having a, a sort of knock-on effect in the way I think you're, you're implying. So I think the, the, the kind of the burden of the question falls on agreeing a fiscal framework that meets the terms set out in the, in the Smith Commission and in the command paper. I, I'm, I'm totally confident that we can do that. Okay. In terms of the, the issue around flexibility, um, you, you've spoken about flexibility a number of times. Obviously, after the... Um, well, the, the, the Scottish Parliament will very soon have responsibility for a, a, a portion of, it, of, of income tax. The Smith Commission and the command paper proposed going further. We'll see how that process plays out. But beyond those taxes, plus land and building transaction tax and landfill tax, the, the, the other suite of taxes that are available to governments as, as levers obviously remain reserved competences. So therefore, in terms of the flexibility that a government actually has to react to any given situation. For example, you mentioned um, the, the impact on the block grant, although it will be a smaller portion of the Scottish budget uh, of, for example, continued austerity. Um, the range of taxes that are available to the, at the Scottish Government's disposal uh, are, are, are quite limited in terms of where they can be applied and who they would apply to uh, in order to generate potentially additional income. Would you accept that? No, I wouldn't, because um, uh, I would say that where you have a situation where uh, taxes paid by Scottish taxpayers are, um, uh, are, are will, will in future be funding more than half of the expenditure that's determined here, um, and where those are all taxes, uh, mainly taxes that have a broad base, income tax, very broad base, the entire population, the entire who, who of, of, of income taxpayers, um, uh, VAT, a very broad base, and where uh, I think there is a significant incentive that is, um, that is created by what Smith is recommending and which we're following through on, uh, on VAT in the sense that um, uh, uh, wise economic decisions that lead to more economic activity will lead to higher VAT revenues, which will lead to greater 
um, uh, revenue at the disposal of the Scottish Government to use as it, as it, uh, as it pleases. I actually think that, that gives a vast degree of flexibility. Of course, there are some of the taxes that have narrower bases. Stamp duty is, 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 is narrower, or the land and buildings transaction tax, as it, as it shortly will be, because um, it's just property transactions, air passenger duty, air travellers, and so on. But, but actually, I think that there's, a, there's a pretty wide um, uh, choice of, 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 of tax levers uh, available. Um, uh, and I think that gives a lot, of, a lot more financial flex flexibility to be much more kind of for the Scottish Parliament and the Scottish Government to be much more financially self-sustaining to make those decisions in the round here. And uh, if, it, if, it is the, if it is the wish to say we wish to have higher public expenditure, then there are plenty of tax levers there to achieve that. Okay. Ian, yeah, with, with one further question, but I just want um, to let Gavin in with a supplementary. It was on, it was on a supplementary to the previous question. Uh, really? Okay, thanks. Sure. I mean, I, I um, sorry. Yeah. I'm, 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 grateful, I'm grateful. I mean, I, I don't share Professor Heald's uh, view on gaming, but I, th I think he, he does raise a fair point in that the situation, as I understand it just now, is that the Scottish government, as, as Mark suggested, has to declare its intentions with income tax in the November prior to the start of the financial year. The UK government, in some cases, have you said, have set it out a year in advance or so. Um, but in some cases, it might be done at the time of the autumn statement, which in recent years has, has been sort of early December. So you've, you do have a situation where the Scottish Government has to declare its hand effectively a month before the UK Government. And I just wonder, in terms of the, the fiscal framework you're discussing, is, is there any um, logical reason for that being the case? Or could you have a situation where, where both of them um, effectively uh, uh, declare their hands round about the same time? I just wonder... So the constraint is one of practicality, okay. which is um, the time it takes for HMRC to implement decisions ad administratively to make sure that the intention can actually be effected. So, for example, if you want to increase the personal allowance or um, uh, in future change bans or whatever, um, then uh, HMRC have to make adjustments to their systems and inform taxpayers and so on. That's the constraint. I don't think there's anything particularly kind of religiously important about November as opposed to December. Um, and uh, I think it would be a perfectly good thing to talk about with HMRC as to whether there was that bit of, bit of flexibility. I think I'm right in saying that the, that the budgetary cycle here has, has always been kind of October, November, as opposed to December. So actually it fits logically with the way that you do business in the Scottish Parliament. But if, um, if there was a suggestion that, that um, you wanted to change that to make it sort of co-terminous with the date of the autumn statement, for example, um, I'm not aware of any practical constraints that would prevent that. If you wanted to say, we want to hold back our decisions until the, until the 25th of March, um, and HMRC couldn't implement them in time, that would create a serious practical problem which, which, which couldn't be overcome. But as to whether it's November or December, um, unless, I'm quite happy to investigate it, but unless you know, we were told, well, there's some particular practical consideration in respect of, for example, the Scottish rate of income tax or the full devolution of income tax in due course, I see no particular problem with that in and of itself. Thanks. Thank, thank you. Just on, on the issue around borrowing powers, um, and uh, forgive me on this, I may have missed a clarification, but there, there was some suggestion that while the expectation was that the new borrowing powers that would come uh, post-Smith would be to uh, supplement and augment the capital grant that the Scottish Government receives, there was some indication that the, the command paper was suggesting it would replace the capital grant rather than supplement it. Can you clarify what the Treasury's position is on that? So um, Smith recommended a number of things in relation to borrowing. The first was the point that we, we were exploring earlier, which is do you need additional borrowing powers for, uh, to deal with sort of cash fluctuations, if you like, in receipts? Um, uh, and that's something where that will be part of the discussion on the fiscal framework, but I would anticipate that there would need to be an increase in borrowing powers for that because you've got greater tax volatility, so therefore borrowing is necessary to help manage that, that that uh, volatility. Um, in respect of capital spending, um, Smith said that we should look at, but not, didn't recommend definitely going ahead with this, but it was one of the options he said should be examined, was um, introducing a prudential regime for capital expenditure uh, in, the, in the Scottish Government. Um, so what has been said is that that will be investigated as part of the discussions between the governments. I don't think anyone has, has, has said that that's what they prefer. Um, but that's a debate that we can have. Um, there, are, there are clearly um, 
uh, you know, there are clearly ups and you know, positives and, and downsides to that. Obviously, having something which replaced the capital grant, which we have at the moment, that could be difficult. And uh, um, therefore, you know, that I would have misgivings about that. Um, equally, uh, in respect of, there's already a prudential regime for local authorities, which I think most local authorities would say works reasonably effectively. So there may be some, some upsides to look at. I don't have a view on that, actually, at the moment. I think that's something we should just we should we should look into. And Smith doesn't recommend it, and we don't say that we're going to do it here. We say that we'll look at it in the way that Smith said as part of the uh, the, the fiscal discussions. Um, you know, other options would be um, to have uh, 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 greater borrowing powers for, in respect of capital um, to reflect the greater devolution of of, of, of taxation. Um, you know, those are all things that that I think can and and, and should be examined. Thank you. Uh, Malcolm, to be followed by Jean. Uh, I've got a couple of issues that haven't been raised before, but just before that, if I could just uh, pick up briefly on what's been discussed already. I mean, I tend to agree with you about the operation of the Barnett formula hitherto, because in 16 years of this parliament, I'm, I'm not aware of any, there might be one, any, but I'm not aware of any people objecting in the parliament to the way it's operated. But I suppose the, the concern looking ahead is the relationship of the Barnet formula to the block grant adjustment. I mean, if you could say a bit more, obviously the, the committee's report did express concern about the constraining factor. And obviously we heard a lot about this, I think some from yourself and from John Swinney about your disagreements about the block grant adjustment for the taxes that we're getting in April. So we were, I'm sure we were reassured that you accepted the principle that we should benefit if we, you know, have economic um, successes in Scotland from our policies, but I suppose perhaps it would be helpful if you did explain what what you what the disagreement was and what the constraining factor is, because as presented to us by John Swinney, it appeared to be having a detrimental effect on the Barnet formula, which it shouldn't have. Do you mean do you, do you mean specifically around stamp duty? Yes, yes. Yeah. yeah. Um, I don't think there was a disagreement exactly. Um, I think we were both trying to achieve the same thing, which was to have um, an initial adjustment. That, that didn't operate to the, to the um, advantage or disadvantage of either uh, Scotland or the rest of the UK, um, and that then does, exactly as you say, ensure that the, um, that the financial gains or losses that come from... You know, I'm, I'm sure the Scottish Government believes that it, the new system it's introducing will have positive economic effects. I'm, I dare say that's one of the reasons that they put it in place. If that is the case and it leads to extra revenue, then that extra revenue is fully to the benefit of the, uh, of the, of the, of the Scottish Government. The, the, what we, the work we were doing, which is, and which is just complicated because it's not a very good evidence base um, and we needed to work on building that evidence base, was actually on trying to understand um, uh, the, what the likely level of stamp duty receipts was um, uh, and, and, and therefore uh, we had an OBR forecast, which is kind of from a, uh, done from a kind of top-down perspective um, and then the Scottish Government have put together their own views, I think, based on registers of Scotland data and so on, which is more of a bottom-up perspective. And we're trying to reconcile those two to come to a position that we both agreed was, was, a, was a fair amount. And in the end, I think we were both quite happy to, to agree on an average of the two as a, as a, uh, as a, as a starting point. Um, that's a sort of workmanlike solution to, 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 um, uh, to a question where um, you know, the, 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 the data needed to be really improved. And I think there's, a, there's an important point which I hope the committee might take on in, 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 in this, which is um, that I think part of what will be needed as we put in place this new fiscal framework is a much more robust framework of independent scrutiny of fiscal uh, or, or assessment of fiscal numbers in Scotland as well. You know, we have the OBR UK-wide. There's a Scottish Fiscal Commission which has been established. Um, uh, I, I would hope that, you, that there would be agreement that uh, that needs to be robustly independent. That will aid the committee in its scrutiny of, 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 of the Scottish Government, um, as well as ensuring that, that we don't end up arguing between governments about these numbers because we have you know, independent bodies who are, who are for example, scrutinising tax, re tax receipts and so on. I think that will be... In, uh, in, in order to make the fiscal framework robust, um, having a fully independent Scottish Fiscal Commission alongside a fully independent Office of Budget Responsibility, I think would be um, a, a, a Scottish Fiscal Commission that's resourced to carry out what will be more detailed functions in future. I think that, that is something that would be important. 
Yeah, well, I was, I was going to ask you about that, which, which I will do, but, but just, just for further clarity, I mean, we were told that the constraining factor involved calculating up to about 20, to 2029 or 2030 what the devolved taxes would generate, and we were a bit puzzled why that was... Um, there was work that was done to, to, to look at that, but that was just tr it was it was as, as an aid to try and understand which of the sets of numbers was likely to be more accurate, because obviously that informs um, uh, how the how the adjustment works. In the end, what we settled on was this figure for the 2015-16 financial year, and agreed that we'd do a bit more work and perhaps look at it in the broader context that, that Smith um, uh, establishes. So. Um, so what we haven't, what we've agreed is the amount for this year. We haven't agreed on how this thing gets, you know, by what methodology this is indexed in future. To be fair, um, uh, uh, so there's a, there's a further discussion to be had about that. Right. So uh, to, going back to the earlier point, your command paper said that the Scottish government quoting should bring forward proposals fully consistent with the OECD principles and reflecting the UK experience with the OBR to enhance the Scottish Fiscal Commission as part of agreement to a new fiscal framework for Scotland. Would you like to say a bit more about how, obviously it's our decision, but from your point of view, what, what, what did you have in mind when, you were, when, when the command paper said that? Yeah. Um, so actually this is an area in, uh, in economic policy making where the UK has led the way in the last f few years. Um, the, uh, the Office of Budget Responsibility is is fully independent and in particular takes responsibility for economic forecasting and not just assessing and scrutinizing numbers. So um, uh, it's no longer the case that I as a minister have any say over what the economic forecast says and clearly the economic forecast is really important because it then underlines what are the determin you know, how much revenue do you expect to get next year? Well, let's take stamp duty for example. If your forecast is that there's going to be um, massive economic growth next year, you would expect stamp duty receipts to be stronger. If your forecast is for very weak economic growth, you'd expect them to be less. Um, the Scottish Fiscal Commission, as I understand it, doesn't have those forecasting responsibilities at the moment. Um, uh, and, and so I would say that um, as you're moving to a, to a situation where um, uh, tax receipts, forecasting tax receipts, is a much more important determinant of uh, the, the budgetary decisions and spending decisions for, for, for the years ahead. I think having more robust independent um, work on that uh, so that it's not ministers determining what the, what the for example, their forecast is for, uh, uh, for the economy in future years and the forecast for tax receipts in future years. I think that my experience in, in the last five years is that that has sometimes been quite challenging for ministers who might not always agree with the with the forecasts or who, who might be challenged because the forecast is, 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 is less good and therefore that has to prompt discussions about do you have to take decisions in, res in response to that forecast. But it is more open, it's more transparent. Because it's independent, everyone has confidence in it. And um, I think something similar um, uh, in Scotland within the scope of the devolution that is going to take place in the next parliament would, would, would really help. And so the OECD has set out some principles. Right. So you would like to see a forecasting role, and would that include forecasting of the income tax receipts um, as well? Yeah, so, so let me, um, uh, if, I, if I may answer by analogy. So the, um, the OBR forecast at each budget and autumn statement, they have a forecast for the economy. They then, um, uh, 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 they then work through what that means for a fiscal forecast, and so they do forecast tax receipts, they forecast income tax receipts, and so on. Um, and they scrutinise all of the data that's presented to them at a technical level by HMRC and by officials and so on, and they reach a judgment about what do they expect to happen to income tax in future years. Um, I think it is far better that that work is done independently rather than being something that is susceptible to influence by politicians. I agree with that, but, but obviously in, in terms of the the income tax powers we're getting next year, that will be done by the OBR, but you're quite comfortable that there would be a Scottish equivalent body doing that for Scottish income tax? Not just comfortable, I would encourage it. Okay, good. My final uh, question relates to VAT. We were, we were slightly alarmed that there seemed to be um, no um, agreed way of working out what VAT receipts for Scotland uh, would be. I, I suppose the two uh, views given where it could be determining VAT on consumption by final consumers in Scotland, or it could be on the basis of the VAT accounted for by businesses producing goods or services in Scotland. So I just wondered whether 
the UK government had a view on which of those um, methodologies uh, they had in mind. Um, I think that's something that we want to um, discuss and agree with the Scottish government. We, what we want is to have a situation, have a have a have a, a, a mechanism which fulfils what we've said we'll do in the command paper, which is to make sure um, uh, that uh, that a share of VAT revenues that represents the first 10 percentage points of the standard rate, and we've added to that the first two and a half points of the of the of the five percent rate, is allocated to to, to Scotland. Um, uh, and that that is able to then be responsive to, um, you know, if, if the Scottish economy is growing better and people are spending more money and paying more VAT, that Scotland gets the, uh, that Scotland gets the, 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 the benefit of that. Um, so we need to agree uh, uh, the methodology. I think it is... Uh, so I'm, I, I'm, I, I would rather not sort of leap in and say, I prefer this methodology or that methodology, because I think it's something that, that, you know, the intention is a simple one, which is to to make sure that Scotland genuinely is getting this, uh, th this, this VAT. Um, how you go about doing it um, is just quite complicated, and it's, I think that's just something that we need to, we need to work through. OK, thanks. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Good morning. Um, I wanted to ask you about the, the um, paragraph 95... 4B, where, the, where, you, where we say the changes to taxes in the rest of the UK for which responsibility in Scotland has been devolved should only affect public spending in the rest of the UK and changes, ergo changes to devolved taxes in Scotland should only affect public spending in Scotland. But um, sorry, Which paragraph are you referring to? So, I'm sorry. Well, I, I'm just... Uh, the Smith uh, Commission report... Uh, oh, okay. 95.4b, and and that's uh, kind of understandable. So, um, for example, if there was an increase in income tax rates in the rest of the UK, this should not affect the level of public expenditure in Scotland. That's right. So, the, so the um, precisely. Um, yeah. So that, and also, if um, if uh, the UK government decided to cut income tax, um, and that led to less receipts. That that didn't cause a reduction in public spending in Scotland. So, uh, where, and, and likewise, if um, the Scottish government chose to increase income tax to get more revenue, that didn't have an adverse consequence for the uh, uh, for the rest of the UK. And that's that, you know achieving that has got to be a key um, uh, a key part of the of how the the the, 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 the fiscal framework works. Um, the, the 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 way that we decided to do that. Um, in respect of the Scottish rate of income tax under the 2012 Act, which of course isn't the whole of income tax, it's 10% it's, it's of the 20% rate and so on, um, uh, was uh, a methodology that was recommended by Professor Jerry Holtham in the Holtham Report, which was actually carried out for the Welsh Government a few years back. And I'm sure, I think you've had Jerry Holtham here, um, uh, 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 which is, they have, that has an indexation against the tax base. Um, uh, in order to, 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 to fulfil this sort of idea, um, we would need to agree what the appropriate indexation would be with a much wider devolution of the, of the, of the whole tax. Um, but the objective is precisely to fulfil that. But I'm a bit confused. I mean, if Westminster decides to spend an increase in UK income tax on reserved services... Are we not then faced with a stark choice of either cutting our devolved services or raising the Scottish rate of income tax? The way I would think about it is that income tax is a devolved, you know, income tax becomes a devolved tax. Um, and so uh, there are UK wide taxes, there are plenty of them um, uh, corporation tax, national insurance, and so on, um, which are spent on um, uh, in, 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 in reserved areas. Um, uh, but given that income tax will be a tax that in future is collected separately in Scotland and in the rest of the UK, and of course there's devolution of income tax on the table as part of the Welsh discussions as well, so and so on, um, uh, you would you would not want to see uh, the fact that um, uh, people in England were paying uh, less income tax, or to have an effect on the uh, total amount of money available here in Scotland. 
No, I understand the tax collection, but if, if I guess it's the reserve matters. It's how, it's how the, the effect on the Scottish budget of uh, matters of, of, of policy on reserve matters over which we don't have any control, but will still affect our budget. And that must have an implication on the, Sc the Scottish budget. No, I don't think that. I think, um, I think, as I say, I think the way you have to think about it is that under this, income tax becomes a devolved tax. So revenues from income tax in Scotland are spent in Scotland. Uh, revenues from income tax in England are spent in England and if, or, or England and Wales, depending on the, uh, the solution uh, uh, for Wales. And um, you want those two systems to operate separately from one another um, and so that the choices that are made in those two systems don't have, a, have a, an adverse or indeed positive, for that matter, knock-on effect on, on the other part of the country. And that's what, that's what uh, is being, is being sought. Is, I mean, it's a, it is a big change in, in, in income tax, um, but income tax revenues in England are, uh, as, uh, are significantly less than the total amount spent on devolved public services in England. So um, I don't think that, that, that the worry you have has any, would have any actual sort of substance in practice. Um, the, the OBR uh, has forecast uh, some of the figures on the, uh, the, the uh, impact, the elimination of the UK's public sector uh, deficit, and it, that, that occurs mainly through cutting public expenditure. Um, given that the that, that well, that's likely to continue. Do you believe that, this, that the Smith Commission changes will allow Scotland to, to follow a different path? Yes. Yes. Um, uh, obviously, the, uh, the, 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 the block grant component of the resources available for the Scottish Government to spend um, uh, is, continues to be based on the Barnett formula. And that means that expenditure decisions that are taken UK-wide are reflected on the block grant, but a much greater proportion of the money spent here will be raised here. And uh, so that does afford the Scottish Parliament the opportunity if it wishes to, to say, uh, for example, we wish to have higher taxes to pay for more public expenditure in whichever areas we wish to spend more money in. That is a decision that is open. Um, it, it's also a responsibility to think about because, of course, um, in precisely the way the convener was implying earlier, uh, the Scottish Government would also be thinking through what are the economic consequences of having higher taxes. Um, and if, you know, and that would have to be assessed in, in the forecast if they thought, if, 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 um, uh, if, if the consideration was being made to raise taxes in certain areas to fund higher public spending, what effect that would have on economic activity, on business, on incentives to work and so on. All those things would have to be thought about. But it does allow that opportunity, yes. Of course it does. I wonder, um, just on, on the earlier on when we were talking about the uh, stamp duty changes that you made in the, in the autumn budget, and you said that for different economic reasons, you, you decided that that would be an overnight change. Um, what were the different economic Reasons well, and and, and yeah. was, is that something that you gave consideration to to what was happening in Scotland? Did you did you think in advance the kind of reaction that would happen here? Yeah, of course. Um, but uh, so the, the the reason for saying this is a decision that gets implemented overnight, as opposed to one on which there's a significant time lag, is um, is to try and avoid some of the economic distortions that come from, for example, people trying to bring house sales forward in order to avoid higher tax rates, um, which, uh, you know, which might, or indeed people delaying transactions to wait for lower rates, which, you know, has, which would have a, an effect that distorts the economy. And um, we chose to implement those provisions overnight to avoid those sorts of distortions um, in a devolved framework. Those are decisions, UK decisions for the UK Parliament. The way Scotland approached it is for this, quite properly for the Scottish Parliament. It's perfectly possible for um, reasonable people to reach different views on how to handle those things. Um, but I think that, you know, that having a big change with a, with a delay where on, on our reforms about 98% of transactions would be seeing a lower, the same or lower rate of 
um, of, of stamp duty being paid, uh, if you then left a period of months before that was implemented, you potentially would uh, uh, blight the housing market for a, for a period of months. Um, that would have an effect on the construction sector, and that was an economic effect that we wanted to avoid. But that was uh, something that the Scottish Parliament wasn't privileged to to have itself. Well, the Scottish Parliament is responsible for its own decisions about how to handle the rates of um, uh, of land and building transaction tax and and what rates to set them at and mm -hmm. um, uh, and, and so on. Um, that's a matter from that's a matter for John Swinney. I mean, uh, uh, of course. Um, in, the, in the first phase, with the powers not devolved till April, that presented a particular challenge. I think there's a question about, in future, how would that be handled? Um, but that's a matter for, 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 for him and for you to scrutinise, not for me. Um, Jean, because we've we'll got we'll start a few members to come in. Oh, right. A final question is um, then, how confident are you that the, given that the Smith Commission proposals are not going to be uh, decided before a general election. How confident are you that, in their in the form presented now, that they will be accepted uh, by a Westminster government? I'm 100% uh, confident that these uh, that these proposals will be implemented. They have um, they have the strong support of um, the, the the Labour Party, the Conservative Party, the um, the, the the Liberal Democrat Party. Um, in my case, it's something that I've campaigned for for many, many years, is, is, the, is this uh, measure of financial home rule for Scotland, which I believe this package uh, 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 constitutes. Um, and uh, I think there's no doubt at all that those commitments will be fulfilled. I think the only, um, uh, uh, the only challenge to it comes from uh, uh, Scottish nationalists who either uh, wish to continue to prosecute the case for independence, despite the collapse in oil revenues, um, uh, uh, or, uh, or who want to, to change this. But actually, I think one of the strengths of this package is that it was agreed by all five parties in this parliament. And I think that, that as much as anything else, with the, the three main UK parties and the party leaderships and the finance <coughs> spokespeople, uh, in my case, I'm the finance spokesman for the, for the Liberal Democrats as well as the Treasury Minister, all making strong commitments to this. So, and, and, and it's not just that it will be delivered in the next parliament. Everyone has said this will be one of the first bills introduced in the first session of the next parliament. Um, and so I think people can have 100% confidence that this is not just a settlement that's built to last, but it will be delivered very, very quickly. And, and yet the evidence in the Hansard through the debates that's happened shows that there, in fact there are a, a lot of people who are not content. You will, you will admit that it's not 100% of people in Westminster who think it's a great idea. Well, there are, uh, on everything, there are noises off. I suspect you even have that in the Scottish Parliament from time to time. Um, uh, 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 but the overwhelming majority of MPs, and crucially, the leaderships of all the parties and all the people who um, uh, uh, might conceivably hold high office uh, in the UK government in the, in the next Parliament, in any combination, um, strongly support this. Thank you. OK, Richard, before we join... Thank you, Convener. To return to the issue of uh, borrowing, I sat on the Scotland Bill uh, Committee earlier in this Parliament where we discussed this issue and we had a cross-party agreement um, that the, even then the borrowing um, powers of the Parliament should be increased. Now, Cabinet Secretary, um, Chief Secretary, sorry, you said um, this morning um, that you agree that with the, the new powers through Smith Commission there to be another look at the borrowing powers um, for, the, for the Scottish Parliament. As you say in that Scotland Bill Committee, that the idea we had for, for the borrowing was um, in addition to the current capital uh, borrowing powers rather than being replaced by prudential regime. But in terms of ensuring that can be whatever new um, limit or new powers are, um, uh, can be scrutinised properly by both parliaments, what sort of time scale are you looking at in terms of establishing um, you know, what, what those new powers should be, the extent of them, what the new borrowing limit should be? So it's a, it's a very good question. Um, so the answer is that um, the borrowing uh, uh, is part of the discussion about the fiscal framework. Mm -hmm. um, uh, uh, Smith recommended, and we've said in the command paper, and I think John Swinney and colleagues agree with this too, that um, establishing a fiscal framework is something that needs to be agreed between the two governments, and it needs to be done... Um, uh, at the same time, 
uh, as, uh, it, uh, as the legislation is advanced um, uh, through the House of Commons. So I, I would anticipate this being something which, which would be likely to be concluded by the next UK government rather than this one, um, but where the, the, those discussions would need to be concluded very early in the next parliament, not least so that both the House of Commons and the Scottish Parliament uh, in, its con in their consideration of the legislation uh, were able to have information about what the fiscal framework would be, because obviously it's important that, that, is, that people can see that that has been done fairly and with no detriment, because um, the no detriment issue is one that's important here. It's also one that's important to members of Parliament and the House of Commons from other parts of the United Kingdom as well as from Scotland. So it's one of the things that, um, that you know, I get quizzed about um, uh, uh, down there as well as here. Um, <laughs> Uh, so I would anticipate that it would be done uh, early in the next Parliament, the next UK Parliament, um, alongside the introduction and debate on the legislation in the House of Commons. I think it's very helpful for their information. W would this, the, the um, principle of a Scottish cash reserve also be part of those discussions? Um, and on, on that issue, uh, the committee's previously looked into them, the proposal um, that, that has come um, from the UK government that um, in terms of the use of funds from such reserve, the, potent, the priority there must be given um, for um, dealing with any potential future deficits or outstanding debt. But the Cabinet Secretary here has argued the flexibility should be there to spend surplus and um, tax receipts in government spending in other ways, which may be sound economic reasons to do. I mean, what's your view and what flexibility there should be for that? And again, how would the, uh, the discussions take place in establishing such a reserve? Mm -hmm. Well, we've already established a Scottish cash reserve, and uh, um, that's been agreed as part of the 2012 Act. That's, that's, I'm sure it was why you were debating it previously. Um, it, there's not currently any money in it, because it, it comes into force uh, in, in, in April, I think, alongside the, 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 the tax powers that are being devolved. Um, the idea of the cash reserve is as a, uh, a financial management tool in-year financial management, really to ensure that the Scottish Government can deliver its planned spending, even if tax receipts turn out to be a little bit less than they forecast. So you, what, you, what you want to make sure is that, that there's money there so that, let's say you've built your budget on the basis of, of, of you know, X hundred million pounds of stamp duty receipts, and it turns out to be, you know, 25% less for whatever reasons, the cash reserve is there to manage that volatility. Um, and I think that it's actually quite important to build up the cash reserve to be able to be available for that purpose. I think in this country we've had bad experience in recent years of, 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 um, uh, of money being spent in good times and then not being available to help with you know, economic problems when they emerge. And so you know, I would be, I'd be kind of reluctant to go down that route, but of course it's something that can be debated as part of the discussions on the, uh, on the financial framework. I think we could debate that for some time, but I, I wish to move on to my final uh, question, Convener. And that is, uh, we've had some discussion today about whether the Smith proposals go far enough. And clearly, we've been talking about the, the, the detailed proposal, though. But as uh, other members have, have mentioned, there's certainly been in the uh, in uh, in the debates in Westminster, in the wider political um, sphere, um, proposals <coughs> that this legislation needs to go further. And clearly, the Scottish government has also expressed that view. Has there been any official dialogue? from the Scottish Government with the UK Government about wh what they see as the deficiencies in proposals and, uh, and their proposals that for wh wh those areas where Smith Commission should specifically um, go further than, than, the, than the legislation which has been tabled? Um, well, the, uh, obviously the SNP representatives at the Smith Commission made arguments in some areas that they wanted to go further, and, but they also signed up to what was, uh, what was agreed. Um, uh, there have been some specific but misconceived comments about the content of some of the clauses. Um, I'm not aware of any formal representations that we've received uh, about specific further powers that would like to be included in this, in this process since the publication of the command paper. Um, obviously, there's a lot of political rhetoric, um, and I'm not complaining about that. We're all politicians. Um, uh, but uh, I'm not aware of any sort of representations that have been made for further things that want to be included. In a sense, the whole point of the Smith Commission process was to have a cross-party dialogue to hear all those arguments and, 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 and reach a way forward. And, you know, I think that I think this is a, this is a really strong and radical plan um, uh, for Scotland, and I just hope that we can all get on with implementing it now and not keep sort of picking away at it. And there are one or two, there are one or two elements in Smith that that, um, uh, that haven't been um, 
yet followed through. He made some personal recommendations in, in the report, as well as what was agreed on a cross-party basis. To my mind, the most important of those is about the devolution of power within Scotland. Um, naturally enough, this process and this command paper is about the devolution of financial and other powers uh, from uh, the UK level to the Scottish level. Um, to my mind, um, there's a real danger now for Scotland that we've become one of the most centralised places in the world, with a lot of power concentrated here in Edinburgh. You may all agree with that. Um, uh, I think there's a really strong case now, including on the financial powers, to seeing how some of those could be distributed to local authorities, to regions, uh, and to different parts of Scotland. And I hope that that's something that, that this Parliament and potentially this committee would want to take a leading role in pushing through. Thank you. Thank you. Sorry, you want a brief supplementary, uh, Jean? A brief supplementary to that. I think um, often we talk about the, the, the five political parties being in the room and everybody <coughs> agreeing and so on, but surely the 17,000 uh, uh, applications to the Smith Commission and comments and concerns from ordinary people, from everybody else, at what point do you, did you consider these and, and, and the, their... Do you, feel that they should be recognised. I mean, there are a lot of concerns about the Smith Commission, a lot of issues that were raised by literally thousands of people who were not taken up. How do you address that? No, I understand that. And I also recognise that, that, as it were, you don't speak for any of the parties that was in that room. You're independent MSP and so in a different, um, different uh, status, and I fully respect that. Um, it was for the Smith Commission to consider all of the representations it received when it drew up its recommendations. And whilst they had a, they had a short time scale, um, both Lord Smith and the other commissioners, I know spent quite a lot of time in their process engaging with civil society in Scotland, engaged in consultation. And um, uh, that report was presented as being the conclusions that they reached off the back of all of the work that they did. And what we have done is sought to take this forward, bring forward draft clauses. Of course, we um, very much welcome engagement and comment, comment on the precise clauses we put forward, and, and um, you know, if there are if there are ways in which they can be improved, then that's all to the good. Um, but it was for the Smith Commission itself to really listen to the representations it received and consider those before making the, the, the recommendations that they did. To be followed by Gavin. Uh, thanks, convener. Uh, good morning. And um, yes, good to see you as well. Um, Touching probably on a number of issues that have been raised already eh, and building on them, and the, I mean, no detriment has been mentioned once or twice. Eh, and I just wonder about it. I mean, I think the LBTT plan with the forestalling is, sounds very good because that sounds absolutely common sense, and eh, I think that's positive. There have been some other things, though, in the, in the past. For example, I mean, the very fact that eh, SRIT was being introduced, which was a Westminster decision, I think. Um, and yet all of the costs of that fell on the Scottish Parliament. So, I mean, it has been a wee bit kind of patchy, and I just wonder, are you confident that going forward we can be clear on these issues of no detriment? Uh, uh, yes, I am. And I think it's, I think it's helpful um, that the Smith Commission was so clear about what it meant by no detriment, um, <coughs> including on the subject of administration costs and how that should be handled. Um, and so, um, of course, there's, the, the, there's lots of detail that has to be worked on behind that, but the principles that are set down are really clear. I think that we have usefully um, expanded on those principles and explained how they could work in the command paper. Um, uh, and, you know, the, 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 so yes, the answer to the question is yes, I am confident mm -hmm. that we can achieve that outcome that you're looking for. So then if we took something like air passenger duty, I mean, I think there is concern in the north of England that some of the passengers might uh, leave from Scotland if air passenger duty was lower. I mean, at the moment, we're in the situation where a lot of Scots would go to, say, Manchester Airport and fly from there because there's more flights. Um, now, if we can get some of them back, there would be a detriment to Manchester Airport. I mean, personally, I think that would be a good thing, uh, but they might get less people flying. Would we be expected to compensate them? Well, so uh, the, the whole way that the financial framework works uh, is something that, we, that the UK government and the Scottish government have to agree. And we haven't spent a lot of time debating that particular issue, though I would say that where you have economic consequences of that sort, um, that's just a feature of the modest degree of tax competition that would be introduced by a lower rate of, of, um, uh, of air passenger duty, and that would be for... Um, 
for the UK government and the relevant local authorities and so on in those areas to, to work through what, what, was, what was done. Um, uh, of course, a lot of the calculations that have been done on this, and HMRC published some work on air passenger duty back in um, 2012, I think it was. Um, but that was based on looking at if stamp duty was reduced to zero in Scotland, what would be the effect on... Uh, on, on uh, uh, Newcastle and Manchester, and I think then it was if it, it was forecast to be a 10% reduction um, on, on, on in, in Manchester, uh, in Newcastle, and a 3% in, in Manchester. Um, uh, now you will have to decide what you do with the air passenger duty powers once they're devolved. But um, I haven't heard proposals for reducing it to zero from any party uh, in Scotland so far. So I suspect, in other words, the effects would be would be um, would be much more uh, modest. Um, but equally, if, for example, um, uh, the Scottish Government put in place some more, some more generous um, uh, uh, welfare provisions under the powers and people uh, moved to Scotland to, 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 uh, in order to, 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 to claim those benefits, then those are, those are payments that would have to be made by the Scottish Government, because that would be a consequence of the decisions that had been, that had been made. Right, so you're not anticipating loads and loads of kind of payments and counterpayments and compensation and things I'm not, going no, backwards and No, forwards. no, I think... I, it's, it's, actually, it's, it's a very good point, which I should have said, been clear about earlier. I think it's really important that we come up with a framework that is as simple yes. and as automatic as possible. Um, the less um, need there is for intergovernmental negotiations day by day, week by week, the better. OK, fair enough, thank you. Uh, on income tax... <laughs> uh, I mean, you can't eliminate it's... them completely, but Sorry. I think the more you can eliminate them, the better. Right, OK. Um, on income tax, I mean, you said already it's a devolved tax. Well, it's not as devolved as, as say, landfill tax. So, I mean, it's kind of hybrid, I guess. Um, I mean... We would have control over the bans and the rates, as I understand it, but not over the personal allowance. Now, some people have said, well, the personal allowance is effectively a zero rate band. Wouldn't it be logical to put it in as well? Um, so you're right to say that the, that the Scottish... <laughs> uh, the, the, the Smith recommendations and what we were implementing here is full control of the rates and bans and all the revenues that come from that, which, and I would say that is, that is not a hybrid, that is a very full form of devolution, but you're right that there are certain aspects, uh, the tax base, the reliefs, the personal allowance, which um, uh, remain at a UK level, and that's for a combination of um, uh, uh, efficiency in terms of the administration of the tax, which is important for all taxpayers, um, and the particular role that the personal allowance plays, I believe, in, in the wider economic incentives in the, in the labour market. But it would be open to you to decide that you wanted to have a zero rate band. That is, that is, um, that's an option that's open to you. What you, what you wouldn't be able to do is to say that we wish to reduce the personal allowance and start people should start paying income tax at a lower rate than than you do in Scotland because the personal allowance is reserved. But if you decided you wanted to have a zero percent band above that, well, that's that is a matter that is. That is, um, that is open to you. So what is the underlying logic that we couldn't reduce the personal allowance or the zero rate band as it currently is, but we could increase it? Well, the per so it, it, uh, in a sense, the logic is that that was, what was recommended by, that was what was recommended by the Smith Commission, and so that's what we're implementing. Um, I think that there is... That the, the, I think that the personal allowance... I mean, in a sense, the, the, the overall economic logic is to say that matters relate to the smooth operation of the labour market across the UK and matters that relate to the smooth operation of the economic single market across the UK, those are both things which are um, uh, economic assets that being part of the UK brings to Scotland. And so I personally would not wish to see changes to those things which then undermine the ability of Scotland to play and fully benefit from being part of a, a, a wider UK single market. It's one of the strengths we get from being part of the United Kingdom, I believe. We might disagree about that, but that's, that would be my take on it. And the level of the personal allowance, the, st the, the starting salary, the, the, the amount you have to earn before you start paying income tax, that is part of what determines the incentives to work um, across the UK. Um, and... Uh, it's one of the reasons I've advocated the big increases in the personal allowance we've seen in the course of this Parliament. So the Lib Dem policy, which is being implemented to the benefit of most Scots. Um, and uh, uh, so the logic is that, that that sort of starting point is something which, which gives people a strong incentive to work, helps to create jobs, 
uh, has helped to, 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 to cause the very strong jobs, job creation performance that we've seen in Scotland and across the UK over the last few years. Um, and reducing that would therefore reduce the incentives to work, uh, um, uh, reduce the uh, effective operation of the UK labour market, which is, which is, I think, when I wasn't part, of, I wasn't part of the Smith Commission, so I don't know what the nature of the discussions they had about this was. But from my point of view, I think that's the argument for keeping the personal allowance as a as a UK wide thing. Okay. Um, well, I mean, if we accept your argument that the personal allowance is part the uh, fundamentals of the whole thing, along with a the allowances and various other things that are being reserved, um, would it not be logical, as has been mentioned already, that all of that has to be decided first and then the rates and the bans get decided second? Whereas we seem to be in danger of being in the situation where the rates and the bans have to be decided first, i.e. here, and then maybe other things get changed to do with income tax later on. I mean, I mean well, as I understood it, I mean, the Liberal Democrats have always been quite keen on modern government, which I respect you for. You know, would, is there not any room, in other words, for Westminster to modernise things? Well, as I said in answer to, um, to, to, to the earlier questions on this subject, timing is, is something that can be looked at. Though in practice, actually, the, 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 the the administrative reality is the other way around, for reasons that I can't claim to understand, but I'm sure Lindsay could expound on at length in the remaining three and a half minutes we have. Um, uh, it, it, it is much simpler for HMRC um, to change rates than it is to change personal allowances. And so, because it affects your, t the personal allowance affects your tax code. So in, in, in practice, um, you can, uh, you, can change, you can't change the personal allowance in a budget to be implemented in 10 days' time or two weeks' time or whatever. You can change income tax rates. So, actually, um, what's being devolved is the part of the system upon which there is more flexibility. You know, what are the rates and, and so on. Um, uh, the personal allowance, something that does take longer to feed through into the system. So, I think it, the, the reality is the other way around. OK, we'll, we'll leave that one just now. Um, VAT has been mentioned, was mentioned by Malcolm Chisholm, uh, and I, th I think just kind of one point on that, you said you haven't fully made up your view, your mind on that. I mean, would you accept, for example, this example before, I've got a biscuit factory which makes biscuits in my, not my personal way, <laughs> in my a constituency, um, but a lot of the biscuits would be going south. Now, if the VAT... A good reason for keeping the UK together, in my humble opinion. <laughs> right, but, but the, on the VAT point, uh, if it's purely based on the final consumer, we would get very little from that. Whereas if the added value of, you know, making these biscuits in Glasgow, um, we get the VAT on that added value, uh, th that, uh, you know, obviously boosts the economy and kind of reflects how well the government is doing. Would you at least accept that that is something worth looking at? I think that is something worth looking at. I think you, you would also say, though, that it might also be worth looking at um, there will be lots of biscuits coming from the south of the border, which people in Scotland will be consuming and paying VAT on. And so you might equally well... This is just the other side of the same equation. You might equally well say, um, we want to make sure that VAT paid by people in Scotland comes here, in which case you, th that would argue for a system that said this should be based on, the, on, on some way of assessing the VAT paid as opposed to the added value. So th there are different ways of looking at mm. it, um, and I think we should, we should assess both. I think that the kind of common sense understanding of what Smith recommended was that VAT paid by people living in Scotland ought to, be, um, exp ought to fund the expenditure of Scotland's parliament. Um, but there are a number of different ways of organising that, and I certainly think the point you've made is worth looking at. It's probably worth saying that um, there are a number of different countries, as you, I'm sure you're aware, that are signed that, Australia, Spain, Germany. They all have slightly different ways of right, doing okay, it, but we do have right. some, good, um, uh, some good experience of different methodologies to, to work with the Scottish Government on. OK, I appreciate that, thanks. And my final point, then, would just be touch again on the, the question of the Scottish Fiscal Commission and the OBR. I mean, you seem to have suggested that it's, it's better to have the forecasts done independently, um, whereas the other model, presumably, is, is uh, to have the forecast checked independently, and which is, I think, is slightly more the SFC kind of model. I mean, ultimately, as long as somebody's independent looking at them, does it actually make a huge amount of difference, whether it's an independent check or an independent production? Because another example would be Audit Scotland, who do a lot of checking, but they're, they're quite a strong voice. 
think it does make a difference, actually. Um, uh, look, um, any degree of independence is better than no independence. But I would say the more fully independent, the more the more fully independent um, the fiscal the fiscal assessment is, the better. Um, because uh, on your model of the checking, you still have um, politicians responsible for originating the forecast. Um, uh, so, look, I mean that's a dis dis discussion that you have to have here. I would, I, would, I would strongly recommend to you, and I think particularly to you as a committee, actually, um, uh, that, that having forecasts generated independently offers you the opportunity to give greater scrutiny to what the Scottish Government is then deciding to do. But, you know, you have to decide your view on that. I think that um, the, the, the more you can take politicians out of that economic forecasting business, the more credible it would be. And I think particularly if you're thinking about, um, uh, as, as other questions have implied, borrowing from the markets as opposed to borrowing from within the UK system. The markets will look very carefully at the credibility of the institutions. They'll look very carefully at uh, how genuinely robust is the framework that governs all of this. And I can just say, as, the, as, the, as the, you know, one of the people responsible for, for implementing the OBR, that the, it, one of the advantages of it, apart from improving decision making, has also been the extra market credibility that it's brought. I mean, I think the final point, I mean, we, I, I got the impression from the HMRC that they feel that they are doing the bulk of work anyway, and, and bringing in the OBR hasn't made a lot of difference. Um, well, the HMRC are responsible for collecting taxes, um, and the OBR would never take that on, and HMRC, I would say, do an extremely good job in that respect. You know, they, they bring in hundreds of billions of pounds a year at a relatively small cost. It's one of the most cost-effective parts of government, and um, good on them. Um, but the... Uh, they produce the raw data, but it's then for the OBR to assess what they think it means. Mm. Um, and, of course, what an economic forecast is, is looking at what's happened up to now, making judgments about what's likely to happen in the economy in the future, and then applying those judgments to the tax receipts you expect to receive. HMRC don't do any of that stuff. Uh, that's independent. It used to be done by the Treasury under the direction of ministers. It's now not. It's now done independently by the OBR, and I think that's a big improvement to policy making. And I, and, and I would, you know, I would respectfully suggest that it would be a big improvement to policy making here too. Thank you. Um, first question then: How do we ensure that the block grant adjustment for 2016-17 uh, is agreed before the draft Scottish budget? Are there any practical steps that can be taken? Um, I, I mean, that's a matter for, 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 for you in terms of how you do it. I mean, I, I would say that there's a strong recognition, both in the UK government and in the Scottish government, that having got this, you know, started in this sort of sensible, workmanlike way, that we have a responsibility to make the next decisions in, in a timely way for, for, your, for your budget processes. OK. Do you, do you but I mean, if you were to recommend that or whatever, I think that would be helpful. Yeah. Okay. But that's your call, not mine. <laughs> OK. Um, secondly, then, in terms of the block grant adjustment for 1516, so the one that has been broadly agreed, you mentioned the element of forestalling, which is still under discussion, and I think you said you're not in a position today to put numbers on it, although the OBR have, have given their kind of broad thoughts, I think, for 1415 and 1516. What, what's the mechanism going to be for, for agreeing that? I mean, are you going to wait till the end of the year and then work out what actually happened, or are you going to sit down with uh, the Scottish Government and think this is what we... This is our best estimate of the situation, and therefore we'll take a view now, and this is the, the extra funding you get. How, do, do you know how it will work out? Um, not absolutely certain. I think the more logical thing to do would be to sit down um, relatively early in the next financial year and tr try and look at what's actually happened. Um, you know, obviously, the Scottish Government is going to want to use this money for, for whatever purposes it, it, it chooses, and so... I think there's you know, perfectly good argument to say let's get this done early in the next financial year. But I think we'd want to have a bit more evidence about the reality of what's happened. Because we're, we're, we're seeking to make a, a judgment about how much extra money have we actually received in practice yeah. because of this forestalling. And so you know, we, need the, we need the evidence to, to make that decision. Okay. And um, lastly, just a very, a very narrow point, but it's one that the Law Society and ICAS brought in front of us. Um, there's a tax called the Annual Tax on Enveloped Dwellings, or ATED. Um, obviously uh, one of my achievements in the Treasury. I'm very it, proud of it. Uh, good. Well, you'll, be, you'll be able to assist then in that case. I mean, basically, it, it obviously it was brought in to, I think, try and um, cut down on tax avoidance for SDLT. The Law Society raised the question, if, if SDLT is being devolved, and obviously it is, um, 
should ATED remain in Scotland or has thought been given to how it would uh, work in practice? Because obviously at the moment, with the threshold being, I think, two million, in practice it hasn't really uh, affected Scotland terribly much. As that threshold drops to 500,000, right, yeah. it's more likely. What, what, is, what is the kind of uh, UK government view on ATED? Um, at the moment, I think uh, we think it operates pretty effectively as a UK system because it's an anti-avoidance provision, effectively. Um, I saw John Swinney's letter to, mm. to you where I think he was implying that he felt that was perfectly acceptable because actually, um, the, I mean, the issue of enveloped dwellings, in other words, people buying a house through a company rather than as a person in order to avoid paying stamp duty has been particularly an issue in the housing market in London and the South East. I think the evidence is it's, it's been much less of a problem here, and certainly the revenues we've received so far have been vastly predominantly from London and the South East. Um, uh, you know, it's, I'm, I'm happy to, to, to keep it under review and to, to, if the Scottish Government have views about it, to talk to them about it, but um, I, I guess one of my worries would be if you're putting something in place to try and prevent avoidance, then you don't then want to have different anti-avoidance systems because you potentially create loopholes through which people can then choose to manipulate where they put their money. So that, you know, trying to keep those things as simple as possible would be better. But look, it, I mean, it operates as an annual charge on properties. Mm -hmm. um, and as we move down the threshold, we need to keep an eye on where that revenue is coming from. It's effectively a mansion tax for tax avoiders. Um, and uh, you know, I hope to bring in a, 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 a system of additional taxation on high value property equivalent to the stamp duty system more generally, should we be successful uh, in the next parliament. I won't comment on that, Kavina. I shall, I shall leave it there. Yes, <laughs> I'm, I'm resisting temptation also. Um, thank you for that, Gavin. Let's conclude questions on the committee. I've just got one or two to kind of uh, to, um, uh, wind up the, the session. Uh, you said uh, you talk, uh, in response to, to Gavin's questions about uh, the block grant adjustment, you know, you hoped that this would be resolved in a, a timely way, but I mean, it took about two and a half years for the for the block grant adjustment that we had just a few days ago to be agreed. And uh, also in response to, uh, uh, to Richard, you talked about um, VAT, you'd be discussing an agreement with the Scottish Government. And in, and, to, and in terms of the whole fiscal framework, you talked about it being negotiated along with legislation in the next Parliament. I think uh, one of my concerns, and I'm sure I'm not the only one, is that there seems to almost to be a, a very open-ended process. And I think there are concerns that one, two, three years down the line, we might be still negotiating some of these issues. Is there any proposals to put some kind of you know, um, time scale to try and conclude by a certain uh, realistic date? Because if, if there's no time scale set, you know, you have a manana process where we'll discuss that next week, resolve it next month. That absolutely can't happen. And it won't happen because actually I think there is a timetable that's been set out because all parties have committed that the legislation to implement this uh, will be uh, passed in the first session of the next UK Parliament. In other words, the one that starts, you know, the first kind of year uh, after the election. Um, so the, the legislation will need to be introduced and passed during the course of that session of Parliament. And clearly, um, both the UK Parliament and the Scottish Parliament wants to know, in, in debating that legislation, what is the fiscal framework. So actually, that creates a very natural uh, timescale, which does mean that over the course of um, the next few months, uh, we have to make progress on that and, and agree it. I think if I would look at recent experience as being more encouraging, because actually, though the block grant adjustment on stamp duty land tax, which in the scheme of things is a pretty small tax, took time, actually the block grant adjustment on income tax, which is a much chunkier part of the system, that was agreed very smoothly and very quickly um, uh, on the on the, the whole the methodology that, that I described before. And because what we're dealing with here is a, a kind of large basket of taxis, um, I think that the block grant adjustment methodology will be quite simple to, to, uh, to agree. It's only because there's lots of fiddly detail and poor information around stamp duty land tax that it took time to agree. Um, so uh, I think it will be essential that the fiscal framework is, in, is, is agreed between the governments in time that Parliament, both at the House of Commons and I'm sure here too, can hear about it when it's considering the, the bill to implement this plan. Okay, um, thank you for that. And just one final point. Uh, um, HM Treasury produced a, a, a document called the Statement of Funding Policy. 
funding the Scottish Parliament National Assembly for Wales and Northern Ireland Assembly. And it states in 2.25 of that document that uh, the government recognises that this statement of funding policy may need to be revised in response to these proposals in due course. Uh, that document has not been updated for five years. I'm just wondering if there's any proposals to update it and whether or not the devolved administrations will be consulted. Um, uh, yes, they will definitely be consulted. It's generally updated uh, around spending reviews or when there's significant um, uh, episodes of, 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 of devolution. Um, so it was last updated as part of the 2010 spending round, and that was done with consultation and discussion with all of the devolved administrations. I can absolutely undertake that any further revisions will, be, will, will have full consultation um, around them as they have in the past. Yeah, it's just, uh, I just wonder why it wasn't updated in terms of you know, following the Scotland Act. That's... Um, because, uh, I can't remember. I think, I think from memory, I can check this and come back to you. I think from memory, um, the, 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 there weren't big further areas of expenditure that were devolved under the Scotland Act 2012. And so the statement of funding policy basically describes how the Barnett formula works, how adjustments get made, and, and so on. I think that there were not new areas of, of, of um, sort of new departments or new areas of policy that, that had funding attached. And where they have been, they've generally been quite modest, and so it, hadn't, it hasn't needed the statement of funding policy to be updated. It's just been agreed in a, in a, in a, more, in a more low key way. We did discuss it with the Scottish Government uh, about whether um, we should, uh, about, about the timing of the update, and, and, and there was a mutual agreement that uh, the sensible time to do it would probably be in advance of the next spending round partly for the reasons the, the Chief Secretary set out, and also, of course, by then to take account of, of the Scotland Act devolution, which will be being implemented at that time. OK, well, thank you very much. That's completed our question. I just wonder if there's any further points you want to make before we, before um, we finish the session. I don't think so. I mean, um, we haven't talked about the Crown Estate. Maybe that's not part of your, um, part of your, uh, part of your remit. Um, so I had a few things I wanted to say about that. Um, you say it if you want. I mean, um, it's, it's, no, the main, actually, I mean, I mean I'm, I'm a strong supporter of the devolution of the Crown Estate. Um, on Monday, I announced um, allocations from the Coastal Communities Fund to coastal communities around, around Scotland and other parts of the UK. I think it's been a good innovation. I haven't yet heard from the Scottish Government whether they would continue with the Coastal Communities Fund, and I would hope that they would, that when the Crown Estate is devolved, that there will continue to be a system which allocates a, a large chunk of the revenues from the, the marine resources that the Crown Estate is responsible for directly to coastal communities in Scotland. I think it's, that, that fund, has, which is, you know, it's, it's administered independently on a bid process, I think it's really shown some advantages to communities that were previously, you know, found it hard to find sources of funding for projects that would make a difference. And so um, I hope that uh, the Scottish Government can undertake that, that this won't be the last round of the Coastal Communities Fund in Scotland, that it will continue, albeit under a devolved framework in future. Well, you never know. John Swinney's coming uh, to give evidence in a few minutes. Uh, maybe someone will ask him just that question. But no, thank you. And I welcome the chance to come here. Um, I, I doubt I will come here again before the election. Um, uh, and it's been, for me, it's been a real advance in the relationship between the Treasury and the Scottish Parliament to have these sessions. And I hope that um, my successors, whoever they are, and I don't exclude the possibility that it might be me, but um, uh, will continue that because I think it is, I hope it's valuable to this committee. I think it's also valuable to the UK government to have this sort of engagement. Yes, well, we certainly find it valuable and we really appreciate you being, uh, being able to make the time to come and uh, answer our questions this morning. So thank you uh, very much. That being the end of this uh, uh, session, I'm going to call a brief um, uh, recess until 11.20 to allow an exchange of witnesses and a natural break for members.
Malcolm Richard. Just a bit of restart. So just, you know, that's right, as always. Right, we will now continue our consideration of further fiscal devolution by taking evidence from John Swinney, Cabinet Secretary for Finance, Constitution and Economy. The Cabinet Secretary is accompanied for this item by Sean Neill of the Scottish Government's Finance Directorate. I would like to welcome both to the meeting. The, uh, good morning. And before we go to questions, I'd like to invite the Cabinet Secretary to make a brief opening statement. Cabinet Secretary. Good morning, Kevin, and thank you for the opportunity to meet with the committee this morning to address your questions on further fiscal devolution. I set out to Parliament yesterday the Government's view around the publication of the command paper and the associated clauses last Thursday, and stated that these are another important step in providing Parliament with further levers to improve the lives of people in Scotland. We must now look to move forward and develop a bill that commands broad support. There are four areas of the command paper that I'd like to touch on very briefly. On tax raising powers, Smith presents scope for a total of 29% of tax revenues being fully or partially devolved to the Scottish Parliament. We wholeheartedly approve of the intention behind this somewhat limited figure, and encouragingly, there are areas in the draft clauses where the initial drafting is already close to what should be in the final bill. On welfare, some 14% of welfare provision in Scotland is devolved. Um, but this is not just about the numbers, but the substance of the powers that will be important to Scots in the years to come. On capital borrowing powers, uh, the Smith Commission has advocated that the Chief Secretary and I should be in discussions about a prudential borrowing regime for the Scottish Government, which will identify an appropriate set of indicators that financial experts or even capital markets might advocate as being sensible, rather than simply going with the limit that has been uh, set by the UK Government. Um, I would be keen to pursue that discussion with the Chief Secretary sooner rather than later. Um, the additional point I'd make in relation to capital borrowing powers is that the Smith Commission also envisaged that the capital borrowing powers to which they referred would be additional to existing capital uh, facilities for the Scottish Government. I've discussed the issue of the block grant adjustment with the Committee on a number of occasions. Uh, the Committee will remember that I've been keen to reach a permanent mechanism which would be robust, sustainable and fair to Scotland in those discussions. I have written to the Committee to confirm that we have finalised a one-year adjustment for 2015-16 at £494 million. Issues remain outstanding on the effect of forestalling and the time lag in tax collection. I am, I am unable at this stage to confirm when those issues will be resolved. Um, I had to reach a one-year agreement with Her Majesty's Treasury as it became ever more important to have certainty for the Scottish Budget and this was the only solution that I could see being available in the timescale provided. That brings me to my final point. The negotiation around the fiscal framework will be more complex than negotiations on block grant adjustment for the Scotland Act 2012, although that experience is one that we can build on. There are new factors such as the no detriment policy, which will seek to identify the relative costs and benefits of different policy decisions, and the block grant adjustment approach for the assignment of VAT revenues. I welcome the UK Government's acknowledgement that we must move forward by negotiation and agreement in the many important issues that the fiscal framework will cover. There is clearly much to do to construct an agreed new fiscal framework uh, that reflects the, uh, the needs and the interests of people in Scotland. Thank you very much for that very helpful opening uh, statement. In fact, um, I think most of my questions are probably centred on that before I uh, uh, go round uh, the table uh, and colleagues have the opportunity to ask their own questions. Um, well, let's talk about the, the fiscal framework. You talked about it being more complex than the block grant adjustment, which, as we know, has been a very long, drawn-out process. Um, we obviously spoke to the Chief Secretary of the Treasury just before uh, you came in. And uh, he said that uh, he was of the view, when asked about negotiations, that uh, he expected the negotiations in terms of fiscal framework to be tied up within the effectively first year of the next UK Parliament. Is that a realistic timetable, do you think? Is that deliverable? I think it depends on... I think it's a realistic timetable, because, frankly, these discussions can take as long or as short as, mm -hmm. as, as anyone wants to, 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 to have. On the block grant adjustment, um, two and a half years of you know, evidence gathering, different discussions, different research processes, blah, 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 was sorted out in a 15-minute conversation between the Chief Secretary and I when we agreed £494 million. Pounds. So I simply illustrate that contrast of timing of two and a half years to 15 minutes to say that if there's a, a will and a necessity to agree these issues, they can be agreed within a reasonable timescale. I think what, um, what influences the timescale that you've raised, convener, uh, however, is the wider context within 
the fiscal framework is set in terms of other changes that are envisaged by the Smith Commission proposals and the draft clauses. Um, it, certainly, if there is to be any commencement of uh, legislative provisions arising out of the Smith Commission proposals, then um, at the same time, the, or certainly by that time, the fiscal framework should be agreed to enable everybody to know where they stand on some of these fiscal judgments. Okay, thank you. Uh, Chief Secretary of the Treasury uh, suggested that um, once Smith is fully uh, delivered, the block grant would um, be only 35% of the Scottish budget. Is that a figure you agree with? That um, the block grant would be 35%. I don't recognise that number, Kavina, no. I don't. No. I, I was surprised by it, I must say myself. I thought that was um, somewhat... Um, no, I don't recognise that I, I, number. I, I, yeah. Where, where would you put that uh, figure at, uh, Cabinet Secretary? Well, essentially, um, the in terms of revenues uh, under our control, um, the devolved taxes as a percentage of total revenues would be 29% uh, post-Smith. Uh, devolved and assigned taxes as a percentage of total revenues would be 37%. And then devolved and assigned taxes as a percentage of expenditure in Scotland, taking into account um, all of the changes under Smith, uh, would the highest number I could get it to would be 48%. So that would, that would leave the block grant at 52 Okay, quite a significant difference. That's there. My, that would be my that's my ready. Yes. rough and ready response to your your point. But I'll, if you'll allow me, convener, I'll I'll look again at what I've said on the official report. Uh, but that that's how it feels to me in terms of. I'll be very interested in this, and I mean, I think it would be wise of the committee to write to Chief uh, Secretary to the Treasury as well to ask him to explain his figures because. Uh, you know, we're not talking one or two percent here. We're talking very uh, significant uh, margins. Um, let, let's just uh, move on. Obviously, the, we've had the publication of the clauses, etc., and uh, the chief secretary said that um, uh, in terms of Smith, and he, he's of the view, obviously, that that's a, a settled a agreement uh, with five parties. Uh, he says no um, formal representations have yet been made. It's early days, obviously, on the clauses. But I'm wondering if the Scottish government plans to make any representations in terms. In terms of extending these uh, uh, powers, if that's under consideration, I, I saw the, um, the the exchanges with the chief secretary, and, 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 and I think it's I think it's important that we're very clear about what we're talking about here. Um, the, the, there was a process in the Smith Commission, which um, five political parties in Scotland took part in, and an agreement was reached there. Without rehearsing all that I have said on behalf of the Scottish government and the Scottish National Party. Um, a sort of one-sentence summary would be to say that although we support what Smith delivers, it doesn't satisfy our ambitions. Um, so the duty of us now um, in the Scottish Government is to work constructively to translate the Smith Commission proposals into legislative form and practical form as a consequence. Now, in that respect, there have been a number of representations made to the UK Government about the design of the clauses. I went through some of that ground yesterday in Parliament and even before we got to the publication of the command paper we had given um, points and comments, some of which had been accepted, some hadn't been accepted uh, to the UK Government of areas where we felt the clauses could be improved to affect the conclusions of the Smith Commission. Um, and of course there are we raised particular issues. If I, ha if I signal, single out one issue, um, which was the point around about whether there was a veto over our ability to um, undertake changes on universal credit, um, the UK ministers have insisted that there is no veto. Yet in Clause 24, there are two bases upon which consent can be withheld, either on timing and on practicability. Now, to go back to the point you've just raised with me, Convener, about the block grant adjustment, um, I've lost two years of my life on the block grant adjustment already. So when people say, oh, timing cannot be used as an excuse, well, bluntly, I've 
lost two years of my life on the block grant adjustment, as have numerous of my officials, as have numerous Treasury officials, and it was resolved in a 15-minute conversation with the Chief Secretary of the Treasury prior to Christmas. I simply put, say that to indicate that people who say, oh, these aren't real caveats, they're not kind of difficulties, they're not a veto, I just ask people to look at that experience over the last couple of years and come to their own conclusion. Now, the final point I'd make in your, your comment, Kavina, is really on... To, so, so on Smith, if I can summarise all that I've said there, Kavina, the Scottish Government will work to make sure Smith is translated into um, clauses that give it practical and legislative effect, and we will do so. Um, as to the question of making further representations to the United Kingdom Government about further powers, of course we want further powers beyond the contents of the Smith Commission, and those issues will be pursued in the normal course of uh, parliamentary and political life. And they will, of course, be... Um, the, 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 the terms of that debate will be set by, I would imagine, the outcome of the United Kingdom general election in May. I know that the stress and strains of the block grant adjustment, because I, I seem to remember you had a full head of hair two years ago before that all Well, uh, I wouldn't started. go quite that far, can be there, but... Uh, um, in terms of um, inter-government... Uh, mental machinery. The Smith Commission stated that, and I quote, the current intergovernmental machinery between the Scottish and UK governments, including the Joint Ministerial Committee structures, must be reformed as a matter of urgency and scaled up significantly to reflect the scope of the agreement arrived at by the parties. And I pointed out to, to the Chief Secretary that uh, you know, the Joint Exchequer Committee hasn't actually met you know, for, for two years and the Quad hasn't met for 15 months. I mean, how concerned is the Scottish Government regarding this, and are you, are you pressing for these to be put on a much sounder um, footing in terms of what, uh, the, the ability to deliver Smith promptly? Uh, my observation in all of this is that th these, this dialogue has to be meaningful. Um, the fact that the Quad hasn't met for 15 months doesn't mean to say there's no dialogue between ministers on different issues, and, you know, Chief Secretary and I and other UK ministers are in touch on a variety of different issues and, and resolving issues bilaterally. I think the, the, my observation about the Joint Ministerial Committee or the Joint Exchequer Committee um, or even to an extent the Finance Minister's Quad, although um, certainly on one occasion in the Finance Minister's Quad um, uh, you know, a very real discussion was resolved um, involving the four administrations. Uh, that was about um, the establishment of a budget exchange mechanism where uh, the UK government intended to withdraw such a facility and the three devolved administrations said that we were not prepared to agree to that and we got to an outcome which we consider to be satisfactory. So I can think of at least one thing, one major element of our financial architecture which was well constructed out of the Finance Minister's Quad. But on the whole, the Joint Ministerial Committee, the Joint Exchequer Committee, the Finance Minister, of course, they're a bit formal, they're a bit mechanical about what they're doing. I'm not sure they're particularly um, meaningful, other than on that particular example I've given about the budget exchange mechanism. I think most of the business is transacted in a bilateral fashion, because an issue that affects me uh, and the Scottish Government might not be the same issue that affects my counterpart in Northern Ireland. Um, and we would all obviously res reserve our right to pursue the issues about which we're concerned bilaterally. I think the, the experience of the Joint Exchequer Committee, for example, which was put into these arrangements uh, post Kalman to try to resolve some of the financial issues mm. has uh, failed to... It's, it's proved no useful function in relation to the agreement of the block grant adjustment. I understand what you're saying about some of these formal meetings, but how do you actually ensure accountability and transparency if, if things are done on an informal basis? You talked about you know, your 15-minute conversation with regard to the block grant adjustment. Uh, I mean, throughout the, kind of the process um, of evidence-taking, we've had numerous professors, I uh, quoted about eight different ones to, uh, to, to uh, the... Uh, the, the Chief Secretary um, during my exchanges with him, all of whom stressed the importance of accountability and transparency across this entire yeah. uh, process. So I'm just wondering how well, you ensure that. I, I, I agree with that, Convener, and it's essentially what, you know, what I've tried to do, and of course I'm always prepared to uh, consider carefully what the Finance Committee says about how this has been handled, but without 
compromising the ability to undertake a negotiation with the UK government, which I think the Chief Secretary has confirmed this morning, these issues are actively negotiated um, by um, both governments. Uh, without compromising that necessary requirement for negotiation, I try to ensure this committee is advised of as much information as I can, as timorously as I can, about the sequence of events that we're taking. So, you know, I'm a fairly frequent attender of this committee. Mm -hmm. The committee has been able to ask me on different occasions about progress on the block grant adjustment, and I have given as I, well, I've given accurate assessments of where we are in the process on every occasion, and where I had the opportunity to advise the committee about the level of the block grant adjustment that had been agreed. I did that as timorously as I could. Okay. Um, I, but I, I, do th I do think that, however, Kavira, there is a general point about accountability and transparency, given the sensitivity of the issues with which we are now dealing, that has to be reflected very strongly by both governments. Th uh, thank you for that. I've just got one further point before I uh, open up to colleagues around the table. And uh, when I asked the Chief Secretary if there was any further points to make to committee, he was enthusiastic about the devolution of the Crown Estate, and he asked whether or not yeah, a rhetorical question to us, of course, but one I think I'm sure he was quite keen for me uh, or one of my colleagues to ask you, which was whether uh, consideration will be given to continued um, uh, continuation of the, 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 the Coastal Communities Fund. I'm just wondering if you get any thoughts at this stage on that. The Government's taken no detailed decisions about this point, but the Coastal Communities Fund is a very good initiative. We've been supportive of its establishment and I can see no reason why the Scottish Government would not continue the Coastal Communities Fund. Thank you uh, very much for that clear answer. Uh, uh, the first colleague to ask questions will be Richard to be followed by Malcolm. Thank you very much, Convener. I just want to follow up uh, with, with one question. Um, after the Convener uh, raised Cabinet Secretary the issue of a dialogue with the UK Government on powers going beyond what's been proposed by the Smith Commission. And you know, reflecting on, on your response to him, is it fair to say, to represent your view, and please tell me if it's not fair, we wish to be unfair to you, that uh, it is in fact the Scottish Government's intention to make representations after the next UK election that should be further for the devolution of powers through that legislation uh, to the extent of full fiscal autonomy? The, let me just perhaps try to explain again the, 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 the difference in the context of what I was trying to say to the convener. First thing I'd want to, to say is that the, the government signed up, well, I, actually the government didn't sign up, the Scottish National Party signed up to the Smith Commission, and since we have a Scottish National Party government, we have a government that will implement the... Um, the terms of the Smith Commission and will participate to enable that to happen. And what the government's approach will be um, will be to ensure that the terms of the Smith Commission um, agreement are translated into legislative and practical form um, and uh, within the spirit of what was envisaged by the Smith Commission. We will not try to use that process of the Smith dialogue to get extra powers because there was an agreement which we have to see translated into reality. Um, however, the dynamics of the United Kingdom general election um, will of itself create a, a, a political scenario which uh, could be, is likely to be very different to the one that we face just now. And in that context, the Scottish Government has made no secret of the fact that we believe the Scottish Parliament should acquire more powers, and we will seek to use the political process to enable us to secure such powers. And the Scottish Government's belief is that uh, Scotland will be uh, best served by exercising uh, full fiscal autonomy. And is the Scottish Government at this point then in a position to say what those powers should be, or is that something you're going to leave for well, I, th I think I think any reading of what we submitted to the Smith Commission as the submission of the Scottish National Party um, by, by nature, the Scottish Government um, is a summary of that position. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you, Richard. Uh, Malcolm, to follow by Joan. In your letter to us, the committee, to Kenny actually, but to us, the committee uh, more generally, uh, of the 19th of January, you said that if stamp duty land tax had applied in Scotland next year, 
it would have raised £198 million. Pounds. That's the revenue foregone by the UK Government uh, next year. In your letter to us of the 22nd of January, you said that uh, land building transaction tax, you would raise £235 million from it next year. So I'm just puzzled by the discrepancy between those two figures. If, if you're pursuing a policy of revenue neutrality, one would have expected those two figures to be the same. Well, if, if that was the case, then we would have had a block grant adjustment of £461 million. But we don't have a block grant adjustment of £461 million. We've got a block grant adjustment of £494 million. So that is fundamentally the difference between those two figures. The the figure that Mr Chisholm quotes to me of £198 million is what we, would have, what, what we believe would be realised by the application of the UK Government's stamp duty proposals post-autumn statement in Scotland in 1516. Um, and that's part of a total amount of tax raised out of stamp duty and landfill tax of £461 million. And that was the OBR and UK government estimate of what would be raised. Um, sorry, that's, that's, that was my estimate of what would be raised. But the UK government's estimate was much higher at £524 million. Pounds. And what the Chief Secretary and I eventually agreed to do was to split the difference and have a block grant adjustment of £494 million. Pounds. So the tax figures which I have shared with the committee are predicated on revenue neutrality being anchored around about £494 million. Pounds. But why have you put all that difference onto um, land building transaction tax residential? You would have expect, I would have expected you to split the difference on all three of the elements of the block grant, the taxes relevant to the block grant adjustment. Um, no, because I have uh, I've maintained I have no reason to change my estimate on non-residential transactions. I set out that, that basis and I have no basis for changing that and I have no basis for changing the landfill tax element of the proposals. The only one that has changed is residential transactions on land and buildings transaction tax. Yeah, but you, but you don't agree with... You don't, you don't agree with the UK estimates for any of those three, so why have you just adjusted it for one? Um, because, well, because I've, I'm, I have confidence in the, I have confidence in the estimates that I have made around these other factors, and the only one of the tax that's changing is the, a, is the, non is, is the residential element of LBTT. But you haven't got confidence around your estimate of 198 million for land building transaction tax. It, well, I, I've got confidence around the estimates that, I, that, 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 that I've made and I've set a tax to realise that sum of money. But, but in general, your personal belief is that people actually will be paying more in land building transaction tax than they would have done if, if, if stamp, duty, um, um, stamp duty tax had continued in Scotland next year because your, own, your personal belief is that, we'd that would have raised £198 million. Whereas, you, whereas you're now saying your taxes will raise 235 million. Well, what, what, what I've got to what I've got to aim against is, uh, you know, the estimates are you know, the estimates are all very well, but it's, it's what I have to aim against is what is the block grant adjustment. If I want to maintain revenue neutrality, I have to raise um, 494 million pounds. Um, if I if I raise £461 million, I won't be delivering revenue neutrality. I'll be delivering a tax reduction of £33 million, which is not my intention. I've never said that to Parliament. I said I would deliver revenue neutrality. So, um, essentially, if I have confidence in the component numbers that get to, um, a, to, a land and, to, to non residential transactions, of um, £146 million. And if I have confidence in my estimates that landfill tax will deliver £117 million, and the only one that's changed is, non, is residential tax, uh, taxation, then that's the, the number I have to achieve to deliver revenue neutrality. 
So you don't, you don't really have confidence that you will raise 235 million. It's just the compromise you've had to arrive at with the UK Treasury, is that? Well, I've had to set, a, well, I've had to set a tax rate to deliver revenue neutrality, mm -hmm. um, and revenue neutrality has been specified by my agreement with the United Kingdom government of 494 million pounds as a block grant adjustment, and of course, the assessment of uh, all of the taxes that tax estimates that I have made have been certified as reasonable by the Scottish Fiscal Commission, whether that's the estimate on landfill tax, the estimate on non-residential transactions, or the estimate of residential transactions. OK, just one other thing. Um, I think we'll, we'll all reflect further on that. Um, the, you, you said you listened to what the Chief Secretary was, was saying. I mean, obviously our report did express concerns about the block grant, grant adjustment based to a large extent on your own evidence, but he, he said he very much accepted the principle of if, if we um, do things to boost the economy, we get the benefits of that, um, which is obviously one of the founding principles, if not the founding principle of fiscal devolution. So um, he didn't... I, I'm still lacking clarity about what the, the, the point of difference is because you were saying the constraining factor was going to have a negative effect on the Barnett formula and he was more or less denying that. So I think it's, it's a bit confusing for us still yeah. to know exactly what is the, the fundamental point of dispute still about the block grant adjustment uh, for... Uh, the, the landfill tax and the land building transaction tax. Okay. It's a number of things in, in, in this answer. If, forgive me if I go through some of the detail, and <coughs> it, it, it may take me a little bit of time to, to do that. Um, in the command paper um, in 2010, when it came to the issue of the what were called the smaller taxes, stamp duty land tax and, land, and landfill tax, the command paper said that there would be a one-off cash adjustment to the block grant. And that was it. When the command paper talked about um, Scottish rate of income tax, it talked about a, um, a, a one-off adjustment and an indexation mm -hmm. factor. So the indexation point was clearly put in about the Scottish rate of income tax, but it was omitted when it came to stamp duty land tax and landfill tax. Then when I started getting into negotiations with the UK government, suddenly indexation was added in to the smaller taxes. And the meeting the convener talks about of the Joint Exchequer Committee, the entire discussion was me resisting agreement about indexation being applied to those to that first initial block grant adjustment because I wanted, and the issue I was concerned about most, was that this Parliament had approved an LCM or a legislative consent motion on the Scotland Act on the basis of that command paper statement that it was a one-off cash adjustment with no indexation. So after some time of, getting, of making no progress, I accepted that there could be an indexation factor. And then when we started discussing that, we suddenly started having a discussion about, um, uh, yes, indexation, and I suggested we should index to, for example, the GDP deflator so that it would rise with um, changes in the economy over time. Um, and the Treasury uh, advanced a model which was to essentially be a constrained model. So we would try to predict stamp duty out until 2029-2030, um, which would specify um, how much tax we envisage would be raised there, and then would calculate an index mechanism that would enable us, Scotland, to be no better or no worse off after all that calculation out to 2029-2030. Now, the committee will not be surprised to hear that was going to happen over my dead body because if the UK government couldn't predict the collapse in stamp duty in 2007 that took place in 2009, how on earth, how on earth could anybody tell us what it's going to be in 2021, let alone 2029-2030. It was an absurd proposition. Now, we've not heard much about that for a while, but we've not heard much about that for a while because we've just done a one-year deal. And I just caution the committee, when we get into looking at the wider issues about the fiscal framework and where this all leads, and particularly the design of the no-detriment principle, 
I warn the committee that our friend, the constraining factor, might actually make a reappearance. Okay, I, I mean, I think we'll... we'll and that's, so, 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 in, in, so if I, in a nutshell, that is a, uh, you know, that's a summary of the areas of dispute. And they've not been... You know, I know that sometimes I get accused of being, um, you know, obstructive for the sake of being obstructive. Uh, I, I'm, I'm putting in place arguments to protect the financial well-being of the Parliament and of Scotland. And um, I think anyone that signed up to that constraining factor approach um, would not have been signing up to a deal that was in the best interest of Scotland. OK, I'm, I'm sure we'll continue to take a close interest in that and, and may well follow up with the Chief Secretary because it's difficult to match with what you're saying with what he was saying, really. OK, uh, thank you, Malcolm. Uh, John, to be followed by Gavin. Uh, thanks, convener. Um, basically, I'd just like to touch on similar subjects to what I did with the Chief Secretary to the Treasury, and the first one being the phrase you just used just now, no detriment. Now, um, I mean, it does appear in land builders' transaction tax, the fact that uh, they're willing to talk about uh, forestalling and a bit of compensation or whatever in there, that sounds quite positive. But, I mean, we have had other experiences where it didn't seem so positive. For example, they decided about Scottish rate of income tax, we have to pay the entire HMRC costs, as I understand it, which doesn't strike me as no detriment. And that's in the immediate kind of cost circle. I mean, I did ask him too about APD and say Manchester loses passengers. Are we expected to compensate Manchester? I mean, are you, are you, are you confident about this no detriment, what it means that we're going to go forward and it's not going to be a problem? I think no detriment um, is, I think the best way I could sum it up is it's not currently well defined. Um, it is a concept which I think expressed simply is that um, the Scottish Government or the United Kingdom Government should be no better off or no worse off, respectively, as a consequence of the act of devolution. That, that is what I think is the, the headline summary of no detriment. When it is attempted then to turn that principle into reality, I think we'll have a few years like the block grant adjustment because that will be material to determine some of the issues that Mr Mason has raised with the Chief Secretary about um, compensation around APD. You know, I, I would reject that argument completely um, because that's, um, to me, no detriment on APD is that um, we, we have a block grant adjustment that makes us no better off or no worse off than the act of devolving APD saying up to us what we do with it and what mm -hmm. we do with the proceeds and the benefits or the challenges. Okay, that's great. Thank you. Um, I mean, another subject is the whole question of um, the timing of changes, i.e. the Westminster budget as compared to our budget. Now, Mr Alexander seemed quite relaxed as to which happened first. He also said that income tax is a devolved tax. Now, first of all, I don't know if you would agree that income tax is a devolved tax. I mean, it seems to me that a lot of the underlying rules about income tax are being set at Westminster, and it would seem to me that it would be, make more sense if they had fixed the outlying principles before we had to make our decisions about the rates and the bans. Um, I mean, is that an area that you are concerned about, or what? Um, first thing I'd say, I'm, I, I don't actually have a copy of the actual Smith report in front of me, but what the... My, my vivid recollection of the... Uh, uh, I do have that. Uh, thank you. Um, a, uh, paragraph 75 of the Smith Commission Agreement, income tax will remain a shared tax. Mm -hmm. So that, that's what the Smith Commission said about it, and I think that's the only way that one can consider that. And certainly um, there was a, a very clear view within the Smith Commission, with which I disagreed, um, that... Um, some elements of income tax had to remain shared for there to be a remaining United Kingdom. Mm. Um, I think it might have had something to do with English votes for English laws, I think. But um, the, for me, uh, the Smith Commission Agreement makes it quite clear this is a shared tax. So it's not entirely devolved tax, and we don't have control over the whole of income tax, so how on earth can it be a devolved tax? Um, I think the, uh, on the interaction about budget decisions, you know, we have 
we have a budget process in this Parliament which has been um, which is fundamentally differently constructed to that in Westminster. It is a product of the openness and the transparency of this institution. Um, it's founded on the need for dialogue. When I publish a, a budget, normally by the 20th of September, um, which I'm required by agreement with the Finance Committee to do, um, that is called a draft budget. It is the subject of consultation before Parliament legislates for it in detail, as we are currently doing, as we're going to come on to do later on this morning at stage two. Um, and we, we interact on the, the details and the specifics. Um, the Westminster budget process is a completely different process. As we saw on stamp duty land tax, where um, without, you know, a, government here sometimes gets criticised for uh, a lack of adequate consultation on certain issues. Well, something that you announce at 25 past 12 um, in the afternoon, which becomes effective at midnight, doesn't involve much scope for consultation. Now, that's, that's the Westminster system. That's the way it is. That's what, how Westminster was constructed. We were constructed differently as an institution. That model, it, no, I don't think it's a particularly desirable model, because it doesn't. No, but then the other side of the, the other side of the coin is that where um, where we go through our legitimate processes, which are a product of the nature of this institution, um, inevitably that that you know that's a different process to what happens in Westminster, and that exposes us to the risks that we faced as a consequence of the Chancellor's actions in December in changing stamp duty when we had undertaken a well-consulted reform that we'd been talking about for some considerable time. Uh, we, we completed that process, we announced our proposals, and then we found further down the track that the Chancellor was able to use the, you know, the, 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 the pantomime of the Westminster system uh, to do something different and for it to have effect much quicker than we could um, bring our proposals into effect. Can that be changed or is that just inevitable going forward? Uh, well, I, I think that's a it's a question that's predicated on reform of the uh, of the United Kingdom Parliament and budget process, for which I would be fundamentally pessimistic for all time, given my experience. Thank you. Uh, the third area was uh, VAT. Um, we had different um, ideas from some of our witnesses as to how the VAT would be split up, and one suggestion is that it would be just at the, the end of the process when the consumer buys something, that bit of the VAT would either stay in Scotland or stay in England or whatever. But there's the other idea that VAT is, by its name, value added at different stages. And for example, a factory in Scotland might be very successful, might export a lot of things to England and elsewhere, and th there would be VAT added there. And therefore, should we get a share of that? Have you got a view on that question? I, I, I've, I don't have a definitive view, uh, and obviously the Smith Commission ag agreement um, obliges me, and as part of the fiscal framework discussions, to engage in discussion with the United Kingdom Government on these points. But I, I, I do think the issues that Mr Mason raises are material to ensuring that we end up with what the Smith Commission agreement required of us, which was um, a, a, an assessment based on a verified basis um, that was agreed between the United Kingdom and Scottish governments. And I think we should be very open to the different um, elements of academic opinion that are clearly expressed in this debate so that we can reflect that in our discussions. Okay, thank you. And the final area was um, the OBR and the Scottish Fiscal Commission. Um, I mean, Mr Alexander suggested that uh, the OBR is a better model because it is more independent, although we have had different views on that. For example, HMRC does most of the work anyway, so OBR is not that independent. And the Scottish Fiscal Commission is independent, although it's not producing the forecasts, it's um, commenting on other forecasts. Uh, what's your view on that, then? We went through most of these issues when... Parliament considered the, um, the arrangements for the establishment of the Fiscal Commission and the committee was immersed in that process. And we will look again at these when we legislate for the Scottish Fiscal Commission, which will be in the parliamentary year 2015-16. So we'll have an opportunity to reflect on these points. Um, I think 
the you know, the arrangements that we have just now, I, I'm, I'm, uh, I think, are entirely satisfactory. Uh, the Scottish Fiscal Commission has a veto over my forecast. If the Scottish Fiscal Commission does not believe my forecast to be valid, they will say so. I have no doubt they will do that, and therefore they have a veto on my forecast. So, um, I think our approach actually is the more honest and transparent. We do the numbers, we hand them to the Fiscal Commission, they look at them, and if they are satisfied with them, they will say so. If they are not, they will veto them. In the UK, we've got all this stuff about, oh, we've got this uber-independent OBR process, when in fact HMRC are doing most of the legwork. So that's not an open and honest and transparent process. HMRC are doing most of the work behind the scenes um, and giving the data to the OBR, who are probably doing you know, no different to them than the Scottish Fiscal Commission are doing to our numbers. Um, uh, I dare say if the OBR say to the Treasury, look, that number's ridiculous, you can't have that, then the Treasury would have to respond to it. And I accept that uh, the Scottish Fiscal Commission um, uh, will, will be provided with our numbers um, and they will consider them and if they have confidence in them, they will say so and if they do not, they will veto them. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Uh, Gavin, to be followed by Mark. Yeah, good, thanks. Um, Cabinet Secretary, I mean, we'll stick with the, the Scottish Fiscal Commission then, because we're on that. You've said you're going to legislate in parliamentary year 1516, so that presumably would be in the sort of September of this year you would, you would announce that as a, a formal bill. I mean, can, work, can some work not be done in advance of that, though? Because obviously at the moment they look only, um, look a little bit at business rates, but primarily at landfill tax and... Um, LBTT. I mean, would you envisage them, envisage them having any role in relation to the Scottish rate of income tax for April 2016, in which case work presumably needs to begin a bit sooner than, than September? The, the, I, I think, again, we, we've gone through some of this territory before, and I rehearsed it in uh, the, uh, the speech that I used to close the parliamentary debate on Wednesday last week. Um, I have made clear that the and, and I, you know, I, I may have picked this up wrongly, but I, I, I thought I was operating within the, the spirit of where the Finance Committee's line of questioning was to me before, uh, before we established the Fiscal Commission. I got the strong sense from the Finance Committee that it did not want me creating a Fiscal Commission that would kind of run away with itself and do all sorts of things beyond the respons existing responsibilities of the Parliament. So I set up the Fiscal Commission on the basis of the, getting the Commission to look at our new responsibilities, well, some of our historic responsibilities on NDRI, some of our new responsibilities on land and buildings, transaction tax and landfill tax, and as new powers came along, we would expand the remit of the Fiscal Commission. And that's exactly what I set out to Parliament, that's exactly what we will do. Um, and obviously, as we begin to um, work towards the emergence of new powers, then that will, of course, um, a take its course. Although, as Mr Brown will know, um, on the Scottish rate of income tax, we are not in a, we're in a shadow period for some time before the um, uh, full formal responsibility for our element of income tax comes our way. Although, of course, that will now have to interact with what the Smith Commission has produced, because the income tax powers are different in the Smith Commission to the proposals that were enacted in the Scotland Act 2012. So the remit of the Fiscal Commission will expand to take into account other developments. Uh, I should add that we're not just waiting until September about the issues. The, 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 leg, the route to legislation will start uh, before the summer recess, where there will be the publication of a consultation paper on the Fiscal Commission. So all of these issues can be properly considered in that, in that context. Okay. No, I, mean, I, mean, I agree with most of what you said, Cabinet Secretary, but I just want, even though there is a, a shadow period uh, come April 2016, is, is there not some work that they could usefully be doing in, in advance of, of that? Well, it, 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 certainly they, 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 they can be, um, and it was always envisaged that there would be further um, a developments of their responsibilities as we got more responsibilities. But, you know, I, I think I, I've taken the view that it was important that we... We got our preparation for the new taxes absolutely correct. Um, we did that with the Fiscal Commission, and we've worked our way through that, and they have now given us, well, they've given us two uh, uh, accreditations of our headline forecasts. 
It's the same approach we've taken with Revenue Scotland, and I have been pleased. I've advised the convener this morning that um, I have now had clearance from the Intergovernmental Assurance Board that Revenue Scotland is ready to assume its practical functions for the 1st of April, which I'm delighted about, and I'm, uh, I've announced that publicly this morning, and I think it's uh, exactly as I expected would be the case. Um, so we take these steps in an orderly fashion to introduce the taxes as they were devolved to us. Okay. Um, I mean, you mentioned Revenue Scotland. I've, I've seen your press release of uh, either this morning or, or late yesterday. But um, without getting into too many technical details, is, is what you've said today basically saying all the computer testing and the stuff that we heard about as a committee in December, is, is it your sort of view that all of that has happened, has been signed off, and, and while well, they don't need to start next week, um, if they had to, they're, they're good to go, or is that, is that something else you're saying? Well, wh wh what I'm saying is that the, um, the, the plans that we have in place uh, have now had clearance from the Intergovernmental Assurance Board that all necessary preparations are now in place and arrangements can be made to introduce the devolved taxes. So that's me getting to the formal sign-off of saying you can switch off the uh, old taxes um, at the end of financial year and we'll switch on the new ones and we're ready to do that. OK. Um, taking Revenue Scotland a bit wider, I mean, as, as more powers come in, do you have a view on which, which taxes or which extra powers should go to Revenue Scotland, or have you not kind of formed views at this stage? Well, because um, on, on, on the basis of the, um, the, the, the powers that will come to us on income tax, HMRC will continue to collect that. The, 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 that's, that's, that's part and parcel of the Smith Agreement. On... Um, uh, air passenger duty on the aggregates levy, um, I would uh, envisage those um, uh, those taxes um, uh, being collected. I, I have not established the, 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 the precise and detailed mechanism, but I would imagine they would be taken forward by Revenue Scotland. Okay. That would be my plan. Okay, thank you. Um, on on forestalling, there, there's obviously some discussion over the block grant uh, adjustment to happen. My understanding, at least from the answer earlier from the Chief Secretary, was that there would be a discussion in the early part of the next financial year to look at what happened up until early April. Um, am, I, am I right in thinking, though, that whatever happens in those discussions, the 494 figure um, will be reduced? So the actual uh, cut to the block grant, whatever happens in those discussions, theoretically, it should end up being lower than 494? Or is there, is there a scenario where it can end up being higher? Um, I, uh, the block grant adjustment couldn't be higher than 494. It could be lower, but it might not be lower. Okay. Because I might get nothing from forestalling. Okay. So it depends on discussions with. Okay. All right. I'd also add that I think uh, early part of the next financial year feels a bit late to me. Okay. I merely repeat what uh, I, what was said uh, in I, evidence. I, 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 you quote it accurately, Mr. Okay. Um, the. The other point, I mean, just on, your answer to John Mason, you were obviously unhappy with the, um, the Westminster system for announcing tax changes and them taking effect, you know, at midnight or whatever. Or the, or I would the say, next day. don't tip it as unhappy. Right. I, I, I simply was characterising the system as I see it. Okay. Um, as, as you characterise it, then, does that mean you would rule out ever announcing um, changes to LBTT in the future to either bans or rates? and them taking effect at, say, midnight or the next day or something like that? I, I suppose you should never say never, but I think I'd have a bit of a job persuading this Parliament that I had been consistent mm -hmm. with what is expected of me in the budget process. And that's why, and I think at different stages, as we've talked previously, Convener, about when would I make announcements about particular tax rates, I stuck very firmly to the view that the, the right and proper place for me to make announcements about tax rates was with the budget, because the budget was predicated on what revenue I would raise out of that taxation. Now, at different stages, um, some parliamentary colleagues wanted me to announce um, rates prior to that, and I resisted that because I felt that would just exacerbate what we've experienced already. So I, I felt the right thing to do was to link all of these provisions with the budget because the budget was dependent on the tax revenues raised. Um, now, I think I, would, I think I would find it quite difficult to explain. I, I, might, 
I might have a try at it if I really felt I had to do it, <laughs> but I think I would find it difficult okay. to explain to Parliament somehow how, having argued that line, this is all integrated in the budget process, to then say, but by the way, it's the 28th of February and I've decided to change it all today or whatever I decided to do. So I think, and, and that's out of, and that's just me following through what I think are, is the architecture of the financial management of the Scottish Parliament, which I, you know, I absolutely respect. I was, you know, I was a member of this committee when the Public Finance and Accountability Scotland Act was put into statute back in 2000. So you know, I, I feel as if I've been in with the, the building blocks of the foundations of this approach to financial management. So I'd have to have a, a very good reason for not respecting that. Okay. And last question is on, you talked about constraining factors and, and gave your view for um, being so firmly against them, but you said they've not come up for a while. I mean, do you, do you genuinely, genuinely think it is a potential live issue, though? Because certainly my interpretation of the... I mean, this committee uh, uh, were certainly against constraining factors, as you'll have seen in our report. Um, my interpretation of what the Chief Secretary said, uh, and I guess you were listening to most of his evidence, was that he, his view now certainly was that constraining factors shouldn't be in there. He seemed to agree with the, the convener's argument that that would uh, almost defeat uh, the point of devolving these taxes. Do you, do you genuinely think it is a live issue still? I hope not. Um, I, I hope it's not a live issue. Mm -hmm. um, because I think the, the basic point I come to from all of these things is that when a, when a tax is devolved to us, it should be devolved to us uh, neither to our advantage or our disadvantage. It should be devolved neutral. And it is then up to us to take the gain or the risk. And that's how it should work. Mm -hmm. And there should be no um, inhibiting of our ability to take the gain, and we should have adequate provisions in place to deal with the risks. Okay, and, 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 and I think constraining factors create a, a false architecture mm -hmm. around these changes. And they actually defeat the fundamental point, which I think Mr Mason was pursuing with the Chief Secretary, that if we are successful in the implementation of these taxes, we should be entitled to retain the proceeds um, without any um, net adjustment that's, that's, that's negative for us. Uh, and what comes with that is if we don't get it right, we have to live with the consequences. OK, thank you. Uh, Mark, to be followed by Jean. Uh, thank you very much, Convener. Um, in the earlier session with the Chief Secretary to the Treasury, um, the, the Convener asked him around timescales in terms of agreement of the fiscal framework. And given you've just outlined your, your loss of two years in relation to the block grant adjustment, uh, are you quite keen to see some kind of defined timescale around the negotiations on the fiscal framework so that there isn't the same process gone through in, in respect of that? I, I, I think th th there is it probably, something of that, of that nature would probably help. I think, that, I think the, we have to tie this to um, the enactment of the legislation. Um, we've got to have... Um, we've got to be able to see the route plan that gets us <coughs> towards implementation of the new provisions uh, and the new arrangements, and we have to have a fiscal framework that essentially goes with that and um, is satisfactorily agreed in that, um, in that process. So I think the, the, the linking of all of that uh, together uh, is essential, and I think a disciplined timescale would help to resolve these issues. You mentioned um, the, the experience in terms of stamp duty um, changes. Um, obviously, when you announced the, the, the initial rates for LBTT at the draft budget, you did not know at the time, one, that that change was likely to occur at the autumn statement, but also the, um, at that stage there was no indication of what the block grant adjustment was going to be. Uh, how constraining a factor on you was that? And is that an experience that you think needs to be learned from, particularly when it comes to further devolution and, and obviously the introduction of SRIT in the not-too-distant future? Well, it certainly, it, it most definitely did not help. 
that I had to make an estimate in the budget in October of what I thought would be generated by a stamp duty system that's now been abolished um, to fulfil my commitment to revenue neutrality in, in October. That, you know, so I, I, was, you know, I was making an assessment. It was obviously an assessment um, with which the UK government disagreed because we have different ways of forecasting um, property transactions within Scotland. Um, and uh, I obviously have, you know, we've designed a model in Scotland in which I have confidence. Um, so it certainly wasn't uh, helpful, and I think it's of assistance if um, that information is available to, um, uh, to ministers in the Scottish Government in an orderly fashion so that we can take our decisions and advise Parliament accordingly of what we think to be the right judgment to make. I mean, Pro Professor Heald has, has given evidence to this committee and also to the Devolution Further Powers Committee around his concerns about um, the potential for gaming, which the, the Chief Secretary rejected notions of, uh, of gaming or of um, the, the, the Treasury perhaps taking steps post the, the Scottish Government informing them of the, their intention to set certain rates. I think it's November you have to notify on SRIT and obviously the, the question was raised around the, the time scale that that gives the UK Government to potentially react uh, to what the Scottish Government is planning to do. Um, what, what's your take on on that and do you echo some of the, the thoughts that have come to this committee? I mean, uh, Law Society of Scotland, for example, were, were quite keen that there should be some element of uh, financial fair play clause or something along those lines which you know prevents against um, the, the rug being pulled out, as it were. I think an answer to the, to the fundamental question, um, or, the, or the answer to the fundamental question is that we've seen an example of that already. You know, we've, we've, we, we've, we've had this power, well, we've not even got the power yet. We've, we've been in the, the scope of uh, delivering this power. I announced a, a, a particular approach in October, and we've had a, 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 a competing and different proposition um, advanced by the UK government in the process. So the fundamental point that Professor Heald makes, that this can happen, is demonstrated by the fact that it has happened. It's happened already in the last couple of months. Um, so I think anyone that denies that that can't happen is, you know, like what on earth have not been paying attention for the last couple of months. Um, so now I think the Law Society point about some form of, um, you know, financial fair play clause is an interesting argument. Um, it also sits quite closely alongside the concept of no detriment, uh, because no detriment also means that whatever actions are taken by one administration shouldn't be undertaken in a fashion um, that, uh, by the nature of the exercise of the power, um, it creates a particular a, a, a difficulty uh, for the way in which another administration exercises that power. If I can just finally touch on the issue of borrowing powers, I asked the Chief Secretary for his take on, on, on what the command paper was setting out and where the UK government was going. Obviously, there's been uh, the, the, the expectation, as it were, was that perhaps we would see the Scottish Parliament achieve additional borrowing powers on top of the capital grant that comes from the UK Treasury at present. Um, the, the, there has been an, uh, an indication that it may be to replace rather than to supplement the, the capital grant. What, what's your interpretation of, of where things are? The, cap, the Chief Secretary did appear to indicate that he was open-minded on this issue, which presumably is a, a, a relatively promising position to start from. The, the Smith Commission believed that the Scottish Parliament should have um, uh, additional borrowing powers um, in in, in two respects. One, to deal with the, um, the, the, the greater degree of fluctuation to which we will be exposed in revenue terms because more of our, our, our finance will be dependent on, on revenue judgments and revenue raising. And secondly, that uh, we should have um, uh, capital borrowing powers that were in addition to our capital, um, our capital budget. And uh, that's very firmly my view. 
um, any erosion of our capital budget by um, the application of borrowing powers, I think, would be um, would not be to translate the Smith Commission proposals into um, practical effect. And so, presumably, that will be the basis on which Scottish Government enters into the discussion with Correct. the UK Government. Okay. Thank you. Jean? Um, <clears throat> we're just really... Uh, Cabinet Secretary want to ask you the same questions that I, that I asked of the, the Chief Secretary to the Treasury uh, around the taxes raised in the rest of the UK and spent on reserved, reserved matters. And I can't see that that would have anything other than a detrimental effect potentially on, on Scotland. So that <clears throat> if, if we are then faced with a stark choice of either cutting our devolved services or, or increasing taxes, are we not having to be reactionary uh, to, the, to any decision of the tax raising powers for the rest of the UK? I think the, um, if I go back to the the, the, the point the convener asked me at the outset about what proportion of our budget was dependent on um, the block grant, um, I, um, you know, I think the, you know, the, the, the point I said to the convener was that devolved uh, and assigned uh, taxes as a percentage of the post-Smith um, spending, revenue and spending package would be uh, about 48%. So 52% would still be dependent on a block grant. And obviously, if a UK government was exercising an approach which was restricting that, uh, the, 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 the public expenditure that drove that block grant, then we would, we would have the implications of, uh, of, of that within our public finances. And I think the, the, the key point, and this is, the, this, this is really a direct point and consequence of the referendum, our public finances are still operating in Scotland within a UK framework. Mm -hmm. Macroeconomic issues and issues about the strategic nature of the public finances remain reserved functions. So a UK government taking decisions with which we may be profoundly in disagreement in Scotland about the approach to public spending um, uh, would still be able to be applied and have an effect on the government in Scotland. And would you agree, therefore, that the ability um, for Scotland to follow a different path on the austerity programme, as the OBR is predicting that most of the, the, the payments to reduce the deficit in the United Kingdom are coming from public services, therefore Scotland trying to reverse that, do you, I mean, can you see opportunities for Scotland to do that? We obviously, as a, as, a, as, a, as a government, we are, um, we do not take the same approach to the management of the public finances that the United Kingdom government takes, and we um, we try to do things which are designed to improve the performance of um, public services and to improve the policy propositions that are available to people in Scotland. So we, we, we Insofar as we can within our areas of competence, we will endeavour to do that and will continue to do so. Uh, the, the challenge is, of course, the fact that we will still be operating within a UK fiscal framework. And um, you know, I've had to wrestle, as uh, members will know, with a 10% real terms reduction in our budget over the course of the spending review period since 2010. So that we, we will not somehow be... Um, um, set free from that framework as a consequence of what's envisaged in the command paper. And just to confirm, I mean, one of the issues raised by the STUC has been that any, any change that we might want to make to welfare will still be at the hand of the Westminster government. Uh, very much so, yes. Mm. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much for that. That's uh, brought uh, um, an end to uh, this particular uh, session, Cabinet Secretary. I'm just wondering if um, you have any further points you may wish to add? Before uh, nothing to add to this.
Okay, well, uh, thank you very much. I'm just going to call a two-minute break while we have a change of officials. Um, the second item on our agenda is consideration of the Budget Scotland No. 4 Bill at Stage 2. Members have a note by the clerk with their papers. For this item, we are joined by the Cabinet Secretary for Finance, Constitution and Economy, who is accompanied by Terry Holmes of the Scottish Government's Finance Directorate. I would like to invite the Cabinet Secretary to make an opening statement. Cabinet Secretary. Thank you, Kavir. Can I begin by welcoming the Finance Committee report on the 2015-16 draft budget? As I informed Parliament last week, I will respond in full in advance of the Stage 3 debate. This session of the Finance Committee focuses on the content of the Budget Bill itself as approved in principle by the Scottish Parliament. As members of the Committee are aware, there are a number of differences in the presentation of budget information between the Draft Budget and the Budget Bill. In order to assist the Committee, I will explain the main differences with reference to Table 1.3 on page 4 of the supporting document. Column A sets out the updated portfolio budgets for 2015-16 following the announcement by the, Prime, the First Minister of the new uh, responsibilities on the 21st of November 2014. In order to ensure a transparent read across from Table 3.01 of the draft budget document published in October, Table 1.2 of the supporting document provides a reconciliation between the portfolio, published at, uh, portfolio budget published at draft budget and the revised portfolios. Column I in Table 1.3 sets out the draft budget as it is required to be restated for budget bill purposes, and columns B to G provide details of the adjustments, including the necessary statutory adjustments to meet the requirements of the parliamentary process. There are two substantive changes to the spending plans outlined in the draft budget that I would wish to take this opportunity to highlight. 
Firstly, the Budget Bill confirms the deployment of £127.4 million of health consequentials flowing from the UK Autumn Statement on 3 December 2014. This, in, this is in line with the Government's commitment to pass on resource consequentials in full to the NHS in Scotland. In addition, to ensure that budgets align with the latest available information, there is an adjustment of £345.3 million to the annually managed expenditure budget provision for the teachers and NHS pension schemes. This reduction to the draft budget 2015-16 number reflects the Treasury update to the discount rate applied for post-employment benefits announced in December 2014. The other adjustments set out are the exclusion of 151.7 million NDPB non-cash costs, which do not require parliamentary approval. These are mainly in relation to depreciation and impairments in our NDPB community. The exclusion of judicial salaries and Scottish water loan repayments to the National Loan Funds and the Public Works Loan Board, which again do not require parliamentary approval. The inclusion of police loan charges to be approved as part of the Budget Bill. Uh, there are technical accounting adjustments to the budget of £124.5 million, reflecting differences in the way HM Treasury budget for these items and how we are required to account for them under international financial reporting standards based accounting rules that apply in respect of the Government Financial Reporting Manual. I would remind the Committee that the budget conversion to an IFRS basis is spending power neutral. The adjustments to portfolio budgets to reflect the requirement that a number of direct funded and external bodies require separate parliamentary approval. These include National Records of Scotland, Forestry Commission, Food Standards Scotland, the Scottish Court Service, the Office of the Scottish Charity Regulator, Scottish Housing Regulator, Revenue Scotland and the Teachers and NHS Pension Schemes. The restatement of specific grants included in the overall 2015-16 local authority settlement, which remain under the control of the appropriate Cabinet Secretary with policy responsibility. Full details of all grants treated in this way are included in the summary table on page 42. I would again make clear that these are essentially technical adjustments and do not change in any way the budget that has been so far scrutinised by this and other committees and approved in principle by Parliament. I would also remind members that for the purposes of the Budget Bill, only spending which scores as, as capital in the Scottish Government or direct funded bodies' annual accounts is shown as capital. This means that capital grants are shown as operating in the supporting document. The full capital picture is shown in Table 1.4 and page 5. As I made clear to Parliament last week, I remain committed to an open and constructive approach to the 2015-16 budget process and continue to seek consensus on a budget which will meet the needs of the people of Scotland. Um, I look forward to discussing that with the committee. Okay, thank you very much for that uh, comprehensive opening statement to Cabinet Secretary. I'm just wondering if you can answer just one question that I'm going to put to you, which is really about the Barnet consequentials. I mean, you received some £211 million uh, to the Scottish Budget following the autumn statement, and uh, the Budget Bill has allocated, as you've already pointed out, £127.4 million uh, to health. Uh, the amount arising from increases proposed for health in England. Um, just wondering if you can give us some information on regard to the rest of the consequentials. Um, in resource, uh, Del Convener, for 2015-16, the Government received £200 point eight million pounds, um, hundred and twenty million of which has been allocated to health, um, eleven million has been allocated to um, match the uh, business rate poundage uh, south of the border, which I announced in my uh, statement to Parliament on the local government financial settlement. Um, and we have conveyed um, five million pounds of ring fence grant from the um, UK government in relation to the Glasgow School of Art, yeah. um, which, in, which leaves uh, a resource deal uncommitted number at this stage of £64.8 million. Mm -hmm. um, on capital deal, there is £26.3 £26 million in capital deal consequentials that came to the government. £7.4 million has been allocated to health. £15 million has been conveyed as part of the Glasgow City deal, a UK government contribution. Uh, to which the Scottish Government contribution is additional, and that leaves Capital Dell uncommitted of £3.9 million. Pounds. There are four, millions of, four million pounds of unallocated uh, financial transactions into the bargain. Okay, and 
Just for the record, do you want to tell us when you're going to decide on how uh, these resources will be committed? Well, well uh, I'll, I'll obviously, uh, I'm considering these issues in uh, preparation for stage three of the budget, and we'll conclude my discussions at that time. Okay, thank you for that uh, clarification. Colleagues, any questions? Gavin, to be followed by Malcolm. Just a, just a couple of questions. Um, Cabinet Secretary, are you going to respond to our report in advance of stage three? Is that going to be this week or next week, or are you not sure of this stage? I suspect it will be the start of next week. Oh, next week. Okay. Um, second question, I'm just trying to work out how much Scottish water are projected to borrow in 15-16. In in I'll tell you what I ask. In the, in the bill itself, um, page 10, schedule 3, um, Item, item four within Schedule three says Section 42 of the Water Industry Scotland Act 2002, then in bracket Scottish Water, and the amount next to that um, is 150 million. In the draft budget itself, there's an item, page 132, it says voted loans 80 million, but then in the document that you published alongside the actual budget bill, at page 61 for Scottish Water, there seems to be a capital of 132 million. So I'm just trying to work at the, the, the three different figures, but I wondered, are you able to kind of square the circle and just explain what, how they match? Whether I can explain how it all matches is, is, a, is, a, is a moot point, okay. but um, the, essentially, as I, in, my, in my comments to the committee today, I said that the Scottish Water loan repayments to the National Loan Fund and the Public Works Loan Board don't require parliamentary approval, sure. so that's why some of the numbers look yeah. different. Um, the, I think the simplest way to express it is that uh, I expect the borrowing requirement of Scottish Water uh, to be 80 million right. in 15-16. So, so the 150 million is presumably some kind of maximum limit it's a, or it's, something. It's, a, it's, a, it's gross versus net. Right. Um, and the, well, there'll be two factors that, that influence this. There'll be gross versus net. And there will be um, what requires parliamentary approval and sure. what does not require parliamentary approval. Okay, but you but you anticipate 80 million. That's your yeah. best estimate. Okay, yes, and, and last issue then. Just again, there's just if you can explain a dis, uh, sort of different figures in the draft budget versus the supporting document. The Queensferry crossing, um, page 122 of the draft budget has a figure of £219 million for 1516 for the Queensferry Crossing. But the supporting document that you published alongside the budget bill, um, page 65, has a figure of £269 million for the Queensferry Crossing for 1516. So I'm just... The draft budget says 219 The supporting document says 216 And I'm just wondering... If what the explanation is for the difference between those two figures. The, um, it's the difference is the payment back to the Treasury of the prepayment that we received on the fourth replacement crossing back in 2011-12, probably. Um, so the, the, we secured a, uh, an agreement with the Treasury to enable us to um, essentially ramp up expenditure on the fourth crossing yeah. when we didn't have budget capacity to do so. I think that would be, I have a feeling it was over two financial years, um, which would probably be 2011-12 and 12-13, but it was on the basis that it would be repaid, which is what the difference, which is, will be, if it was 219 in the budget document and it's 269 here, that's, right. that's precisely, that's, that's right. 50, I think it was two instalments of 50. Yeah, 100 million total. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Malcolm? Um, most of my questions have been answered. It was about the, the, the um, uh, unallocated consequentials, which you gave a very full account of, but I, I would just, and you said 64.8 res, um, um, resource Dell unallocated 3.9 capital Dell unallocated but I take it we could add to that some of the health consequentials that have not been allocated to a particular line and could, could you tell us how much that is in terms of health capital and resource that's not been allocated to a particular health line as it were 
I, I, it will be of the order of um, thirty million pounds, I would think. Um, a twenty-two and a half. Is that resource? Twenty-two and a half resource. Resource. And is there any capital? And the capital. Um, I. I'm not aware of any okay, capital okay. announcements Thank that have been made. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, uh, that has concluded the questions uh, from the committee. We now turn to the formal proceedings on the budget bill. We have no amendments to deal with, but we are obliged to consider each section and schedule and the long title and agree formally to each. We will take the sections in order, with schedules being taken immediately after the section that introduces them and the long title last. Fortunately, standing orders allow us to put a single question where groups of sections or schedules are to be considered consecutively, and unless members disagree, that is what I propose to do. Members have indicated the agreement. Firstly, the question is that Section 1, Schedule 1, Section 2, Schedule 2, Section 3, Schedule 3 and Sections 4 to 11 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. Members have indicated the agreement. Secondly, the question is that the long title be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. We are agreed. That ends Stage 2 consideration of the Budget Scotland Number 4 Bill. I'd like to thank the Cabinet Secretary and allow him and Mr Holmes uh, to leave. Just... Uh, have a one minute recess. Everybody but nobody's to leave. The item of business is to consider a negative instrument. The Scottish Tax Tribunal's Eligibility for Appointment Regulations 2014, SSI 2014-355. I'd like to invite any comments from members. There being no comments from members, uh, are there any comments they wish to report on the instrument? No comments to report. Thank you very much. That was the final item on our agenda. I now close the meeting and thank everyone for their contributions this morning.